All right. We are live. All right, so welcome to Torah Study Tuesdays. All right. And the crowd went wild. Okay. Awesome. Listen, I know he likes when we get that enthusiastic about his stuff, you know? It's great. Amen and amen. All right, so as you can see, I am not Elder Billy. <laughs> who's just having fun on the beach, just enjoying his vacation. Okay, and well, we're happy for him. I'm waving at him there, because I'm sure he's watching. Okay, so tonight, we're going through our weekly Torah study. So for those of you that are new and just found us, so this is the one-year cycle going from Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so we go through about four chapters or so, four or five chapters, depending on the week, every week. We're in the book of Devarim and Deuteronomy, so we're in the last book as we head towards Sukkot because we finish the cycle right before Sukkot and then we pick up again right after, okay? And so, the way this is going to work, we're going to start off with some prayer time and check out whatever prayer needs there are here within the congregation, and then we'll go and read this week's Torah portion. Anybody know what this week's Torah portion is? Re'eh, okay, Re'eh, which means see or behold. All right, so that's in uh, Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 16, 17. Okay, 11, 26 to 16, 17. And we have nine readers today, so I got five chairs out there. We'll fill that up one in almost two times. All right. And so we'll begin here with some prayer time. And then, of course, for those of you that are just watching, so after we read the Torah portion, I'll make some announcements of upcoming things, or I may have Grayson come up and do that. We'll see. And then we'll go ahead and discuss what we read. Actually, I'll teach it first, and we'll see if there's time to discuss it when we're done. Because this Torah portion's got a lot of stuff, so. Oh, I got some clapping. All right, so some of you like the teaching part. Okay, well, I hope you're not hungry or thirsty, because we may be a while. Oh, you came prepared. Okay. <laughs> Because I did take quite a bit of notes getting ready for today, which is going to be great. All right. Now, so that being said, let's go ahead and start with prayer. And because we are going to probably get into a lot of stuff today, let's only keep it to the most urgent of things, please. And so if you have a, an urgent prayer of any sort or praise report, you can come up to the mic right here by the podium. If you're online, you can go ahead and type it in. And we've got Grayson in the back there who's going to go ahead and read it to us over there. Please give the Shamish team that's in the room also your respectful attention as they lead in the chat to maintain shalom in the chat, okay? All right, we'll begin with Marlene, who is back. I'm so happy to be here. I miss you all so much. Oh, my gosh. Okay, you got to keep it right up by your mouth. I'm sorry. I'm so happy to be here. I missed you all so much. Oh, my gosh. That's what I said. There you go. Um, so I went to my dad's memorial on, um, it was on Friday afternoon. Uh, I drove there to Chicago on, um, Thursday now. So I have issues with falling asleep at the wheel and, um, I fell asleep four times in the first half an hour. And then I decided I have to put on like a novel in order to stay awake. So I did that. And then the rest of the, the rest of the way was smooth sailing. Hallelujah. And then, um, I stayed with my, my mother-in-law, uh, my first husband's mother, uh, allowed me to stay with her. And so um, I told her I needed to observe the Sabbath. And so she gave me my space. She let me have her den with her big TV. I got dressed. I put on my makeup. I uh, danced in my little small two-foot circle. Um, you know, did the, the liturgy. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was really cool, really being present with, with everybody. Um, and then the, uh, on the way home, I only fell asleep one time. So <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's actually amazing for me because I, I really have a problem. So I just, you know, those are the last words at the pearly gates of the guys. Well, I only fell asleep one time. <laughs> okay. So it's only, well, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was a blessing and it was a marvelous trip. The service was wonderful. So I just want to praise the father for that. And, um, just for giving me an opportunity to, um, you know, join here remotely. And so I'm just so thankful for, to be back. And I think, that's, I think that's all I had to say. So thank okay. you. Amen. Amen. All right. James? Shalom. Shalom. My prayer is for employment. I'm in desperate seek of it. And also with the enlightenments Father has given me lately, 
I want to learn to live this, and that's why I'm here, and I appreciate everything done here. Amen. Amen. All right. Shira. Just a word to you, Marlene. It's a lot safer falling asleep in your lazy boy. <laughs> From I, somebody who got busted doing that. There you go. <laughs> I would like to ask prayer for my brother uh, in New York, my older brother. He is in a very bad way. Um, some very nasty tumor I issues, and he's scared of doctors. And... He's looking uh, for me and the other sisters to reach out to him. And my sister told me, you know, you really should call him. And I just want wisdom. He's Christian. Jerry Falwell thinks I'm a nut. <laughs> so I don't know what I can tell him. But I want to reach out. So wisdom and, and comfort for him. Okay can do that. All right. Um, as we're getting ready to go over to the live stream, let me just add one also. Uh, this past Thursday or Friday, I'm not sure which, uh, some of you may know, most of you probably don't know, Barbara and Fred Giffen. Uh, Fred was Captain Fred, if you remember Captain Fred with his white you know, captain's hat. Well, he passed on Thursday or Friday. I don't know which day. And so he, I think he was 92 or 93, okay? And so I spoke to Barbara, and, um, you know, she's, she's doing as well as can be expected at this point. And she's, she's, you know, in counsel with me, and, and uh, we're, we're helping her wherever we can. But just keep her in prayer and the family in prayer. Um, you know, Fred was one of those guys that all the way to the end, he, was on, he wasn't on any medication. He wasn't on it. You know, he just was able to go all the way to that end there. So anyway, so please keep Barbara and the family in prayer. Okay, Grayson. From Shirley Akpelu, Unspoken Prayers, Please. From Bruce Taylor, Prayer for Twin Brother, who was told has cancer. From M. Wallen, Praise Yah, this Torah portion, Ray, is our sixth complete cycle with MTOY, and Monday is our 36th wedding anniversary. Amen. From Vaskin, Prayers for Rabbi and Leadership, and for work to sort out my situation and not drag it on for much longer and some unspokens. From Pamela Shuford, praise Yahweh, the creator of everything. We will know what treatments my husband will be getting for the throat cancer on the 2nd of September. Praises belongs to Yahweh. From Lisa Galagos, prayers for my sister-in-law who has been put into hospice. She has cancer. From Robert Brackett, praise Abba, Sarah and I made it home. And then there are several unspoken. Okay, amen. All right, so go ahead. Let's get a, one of the gentlemen to raise their hands. We'll have you open up in prayer today. Okay, um, let's see. Rocky, come on up and open us in prayer. And ask, also pray for the prayer requests. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you and all the prayers that we ask that you hear our prayer and answer them, Father. We ask you to guide us and in, in our day, in our evening, and open our minds and our hearts to the, your word and our teacher, Rabbi Steve Bergson. Thank you. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you, Rocky. All right, so we're going into our Torah portion readings. I have five seats up here. We need to fill them up, plus four people after that. So nine readings today. Okay. All right, there you go. Steve will go first. All right, good. It doesn't matter who goes first. Okay, so, so we're going to go through the readings. I'm going to call up a reader, recite a, a traditional blessing over the reader, and then I'll tell you what verses you're reading to and from, and then when you finish, we'll go to the next reader until we complete the readings for today. 
All right, so let's start with Steve. Let me move this out of the way here. All right. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he blessed Steve who's come up to honor Yahweh. And the Torah made a set apart one, bless him and his family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of his hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to start us off in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, to chapter 12 and verse 5. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse, the blessing when you obey the commands of Yahweh, your Elohim, which I command you today, and, a cur and the curse if you do not obey the commands of Yahweh, your Elohim, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other mighty ones which you have not known. It, and it shall be when Yahweh, your Elohim, has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerzim and the curse on Mount Ebel. They are not beyond the Jordan toward the setting sun, and the la in the land of the Canaanites who dwelt in the desert plain opposite of Galgad, Beside the terebinth trees of Moray, for you are passing over the Yarden to go and possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. You shall possess it and dwell in it, and you shall guard to do all the laws and right rulings which I am setting before you today. And these are the laws of the right rulings which you guard to do in the land which Yahweh your Elohim, your fathers, is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the soil. Completely destroy all the places where the nations which you are dispossessing serve their mighty ones. And on the high mountains and on the hills and under every tree, and you shall break them down, their slaughter places, smash their pillars, and burn their asmeris with fire, and you shall cut down the carving, Im carved images of their mighty ones, and you shall destroy their name out of that place. Do not do so to Elohim, your Elohim, but seek the place which Yahweh, your Elohim, chose out of your tribes to put his name there and for the dwelling place, and there you shall enter. Amen. Okay, thank you, Shama Steve. Okay, next up, Ashley. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Ashley, who's come up to Ani Yahweh in the Torah, may to set apart one, bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to take us now from verse 6 to 18. And there you shall take your ascending offerings and your slaughters and your tithes and your contributions of your hand and your vowed offerings and your voluntary offerings and the firstlings of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before Yahweh your Elohim and shall rejoice in all that you put your hand to and you and your households in which Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you. Do not do as we are doing here today each one doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Because you have not yet entered the rest and the inheritance which Yahweh your Elohim has given you. But you shall pass over the yard and, and you shall dwell in the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to inherit. And he shall give you the rest from all your enemies around about and you shall dwell in safety. And it shall be that unto the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell there. you, There you are to bring all that I commanded you, your ascending offerings and your slaughters and your tithes and your contributions of your hand and all your choice offerings which you vow to Yahweh. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim and your sons and your daughters and your male servants and your female servants and the Levite who is within your gaze since he has no other portion nor inheritance with you. 
Guard yourself that you do not offer your ascending offerings in every place that you see, except in the place which Yahweh chooses. In one of your tribes, there is there you are to offer your ascending offerings, and there you are to do all that I command you. Only whatever your being desires, you shall slaughter and eat according to the blessing of Yahweh, your Elohim, which he has given you within all your gates. The unclean and the clean do eat of it, the gazelle and the deer alike. Only the blood you do not eat pour on the earth like water. You are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or of your oil or the firstlings of your herd or your flock or any of your offerings which you vow or your voluntary offerings or of the contribution of your ham. But eat them before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite who is in with your in your gates. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim in all that you put your hands to do. Amen. I mean, thank you, Ashley. All right, Kathy. You blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he blessed Kathy, who's come up down to Yahweh in the Torah, made a set apart one, bless her and her family, send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to take us now from verse 19 to the end of the chapter. Guard yourselves, yourself, that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in the land. When Yahweh your Elohim enlarges your border as he has promised you, and you say, let me eat meat, because you long to eat meat. You eat as much meat as your being desires. When the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you shall slaughter from your herd and from your flock, which Yahweh has given you, as I have commanded you. And you shall eat within the gates as much as your being desires, only as the gazelle and the deer are eaten, so you are to eat of it. The unclean and the clean alike eat of it. Only be strong not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life. Do not eat the life with the meat. Do not eat it. You pour it on the earth like water. Do not eat it, that it might be well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh. Only the set-apart gifts which you have and your vowed offerings you are to take up and go to the place which Yahweh chooses. And you shall make your ascending offerings, the meat and the blood, on the slaughter place of Yahweh your Elohim, and the blood of your slaughterings is poured out on the slaughter place of Yahweh, your Elohim, and you eat the meat. Guard and obey all these words which I command you, that it might be well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the eyes of Yahweh, your Elohim. When Yahweh your Elohim does cut off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, guard yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, How did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so, too. Do not do so to Yahweh your Elohim. For every abomination which Yahweh hates, they have done to their mighty ones. For they, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their mighty ones. All the words I'm commanding you to guard to do it, do not add to it nor take away from it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I mean, okay, thank you, Kathy. Next up is Janet. 
All right. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Janet, who's come up down to Yahweh in the Torah. May to set apart one, bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. You're going to take us into chapter 13 and read verses 1 through 18. When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, he shall give you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder shall come true, of which he has spoken to you, saying, Let us go after other mighty ones which you have not known, and serve them. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your Elohim is trying you to know whether, your love, whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being. Walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice and serve him and cling to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams is put to death because he has spoken apostasy against Yahweh your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mizraim and ransomed you from the house of bondage to make you stay from the way in which Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to walk. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst. When your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or, your, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own being entices you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other mighty ones, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers. Of the mighty ones of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, do not agree with him or listen to him. Nor shall your eye pardon him, nor spare him, or conceal him, but you shall certainly kill him. Your hand is first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage. And let all Israel hear and fear, and not again do any such evil matter as this is in your midst. When you hear someone in one of your cities, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you to dwell in, saying, Some men, sons of Belial, have gone out of your midst, and let the inhabitants of their city astray, saying, Let us go and serve other mighty ones, mighty ones whom you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently, and see if the matter is true, and establish that this abomination was done in your midst. You shall certainly strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, putting it under the ban, and all that is in it and its livestock with the edge of the sword, and gather all its plunder into the middle of the street, and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder before Yahweh your Elohim, and it shall be a heap forever, never to be built again. And none of that which is put under the ban is to cling to your hand, so that Yahweh turns from the fierceness of his displeasure and shall show you compassion, love you, and increase you as he swore to your fathers. When you obey, when you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim to guard all his commands, which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim. Amen. Okay, thank you, Janet. Okay, next up is Shannon. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Shannon, who's come up down to Yahweh in the Torah. May to set apart one, bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to take us now into 14 and read verses 1 through 18. You are the children of Yahweh, your Elohim. Do not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead. For you are a set-apart people to Yahweh, your Elohim. And Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for himself, a treasured possession above all the people, peoples who are on the face of the earth. Do not eat whatever is abominable. These are the living creatures which you do eat, ox, sheep, and goat, deer, and gazelle, and roebuck, and wild goat, and mountain goat, and antelope, and mountain sheep, and every beast that has a split hoof divide in two, chewing the cud among the beasts you do eat. But of those chewing the cud, or those having a split hoof completely divided, you do not eat, such as these, the camel, and the hare, and the rabbit, for they chew the cud, but do not have a split hoof. They are unclean for you. 
and the pig is unclean for you because it has a split hoof but does not chew the cud. You do not eat their flesh or touch their dead carcasses. These you do eat of all that are in the waters. All that have fins and scales you do eat. And whatever does not have fins and scales you do not eat. It is unclean for you. Any clean bird you do eat. But these you do not eat, the eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture, and the red kite, and the falcon, and the buzzard after their kinds, and every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the nighthawk, and the seagull, and the hawk after their kinds, the little owl, and the great owl, and the white owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the fisher owl, and the stork, and the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, next up, Corinne. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Corinne, who's come up to Yahweh in the Torah, may to set apart one, bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. Okay, you can now take us from verse 19 to the end of the chapter. And every creeping insect that flies is unclean for you. They are not eaten. Any clean bird you do eat, do not eat whatever dies of itself. Give it to the stranger who is within your gates to eat it, or sell it to a foreigner. For you are a set-apart people to Yahweh, your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall tithe without fail all the yield of your grain that the field brings forth year by year. And you shall eat before Yahweh, your Elohim, in the place where he chooses to make chooses to make his name dwell, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and of the firstlings of your herds and your sheep so that you learn to fear Yahweh your Elohim always. But when the way is too long for you so that you are not able to bring the tithe or when the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you, when Yahweh your Elohim is blessing you, then you shall give it in in silver and shall take the silver in your hand and go to the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses. And you shall use the silver for whatever your being desires, for cattle or sheep, for wine or strong drink, for whatever your being desires. And you shall eat there before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall rejoice, and you you and your household. And do not forsake the Luite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. At the end of every third year, bring out all the tithe of your increase of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Luite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates shall come and eat and be satisfied so that Yahweh your Elohim does does bless you with all your work of your hand, which you do. Amen, amen. Thank you, Corinne. Eduardo? He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Eduardo, who's come up to Yahweh in the Torah, may to set apart one, bless him and his family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of his hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to take us now to chapter 15 and read verses 1 through 11. At the end of every seven years, you make a release of Debs. And this is the word of the release. Every creditor is to release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He does not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the release of Yahweh. Of a foreigner, you could require it, but your hand is to release whatever is owed by your brother. Only there should be no poor among you, for Yahweh does greatly bless you in the land which Yahweh, your Elohim, is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, to guard, to do all these commands which I'm commanding you today, For Yahweh, your Elohim, shall bless you as he promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and you shall rule over many nations, but they do not rule over you. When there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, within any of the gates in your land which Yahweh, your Elohim, is giving you, do not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. For you shall certainly open your hand to him, and certainly lend him enough for his need, whatever he needs. Be on guard, lest there be a taught of Belial in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the, the year of release, is near, and your eye is evil against your poor brother, and you give him not. 
and he shall cry out to Yahweh against you, and it shall be a sin in you. You shall certainly give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this reason Yahweh your Elohim does bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand, because the poor one does not seize from the land. Therefore, I am commanding you, saying, you shall certainly open your hand to your brother, to your poor and to your needy one in your land. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eduardo. Okay, Grayson. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Grayson who has come up to Yahweh in the Torah, may to set apart one, bless him and his family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of his hands. Amen. Okay, you're going to go from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. When your brother is sold to you, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, and shall serve you six years, then let him go free from you in the seventh year. And when you send him away free from you, let him not go away empty-handed. You shall ritually supply him from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine press. With that which Yahweh has blessed you with, give to him. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and Yahweh your Elohim ransomed you. Therefore I am commanding you this word today. And it shall be when he says to you, I do not go away from you because he loves you in your house, because it is good for him with you. Then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Do the same to your female servant. Let it not be hard in your eyes when you send him away free from you, for he was worth a double hired servant in serving you six years. And Yahweh your Elohim shall bless you in all that you do. Set apart to Yahweh your Elohim all the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock. Do not work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household are to eat it before Yahweh your Elohim year by year in the place which Yahweh chooses. But when there is any defect in it, lame or blind, or has any evil defect, do not slaughter it to Yahweh your Elohim. Eat it within your gates, the unclean and the clean alike, as the gazelle and as the deer. Only do not eat its blood, pour it on the ground like water. Amen. Okay, thank you, Grayson. Last up, Taylor. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Taylor, who has come up to Yahweh in the Torah, may to set apart one, bless her and her family, and send blessing and prosperity in all the works of her hands. Amen. Chapter 16, 1 through 17. Guard the new moon of Abib and perform the Pesach to Yahweh your Elohim. For in the new moon of Abib, Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of Mitzrayim by night. And you shall slaughter the Pesach to Yahweh your Elohim from the flock and the herd in the place where Yahweh chooses to put his name. Eat no leavened bread with it. For seven days you eat unleavened bread with it, bread of affliction, because you came out of the land of Mitzrayim in haste, so that you remember the day in which you came out of the land of Mitzrayim all the days of your life. And no leaven should be seen with you in all your border for seven days. Neither should any of the meat which you slaughter in the evening on the first day stay all night until morning. You are not allowed to slaughter the Pesach with any, within any of your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. But at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to place his name dwell, there you slaughter the Pesach in the evening, at the going down of the sun, at the appointed time you came out of Mitzrayim. And you shall roast and eat in it the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, there is a closing festival to Yahweh your Elohim. You do, you do no work. Count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. And you shall perform the festival of Shavuot to Yahweh your Elohim, according to the voluntary offering from your hand, which you give as Yahweh your Elohim blesses you. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite who is within your gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are in your midst at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim and you shall guard and do these laws. Perform the festival of Sukkot for seven days after the ingathering for your threshing floor and for your winepress. And you shall rejoice in your festival, you 
and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. For seven days you shall celebrate to Yahweh your Elohim in the place which Yahweh chooses because Yahweh your Elohim does bless you in all your increase and in all the works of your hands and you shall be only rejoicing. Three times a year, all your males appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he chooses at the festival of Matzot and at the festival of Shavuot and at the festival of Sukkot, and none should appear before Yahweh empty-handed, but each one with the gift of his hand, according to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim, which he has given you. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you to all the readers. Excellent. All right. The traditional blessing after the Torah reading. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher natan lano Torah te'emet vechaye olam natabit ochenu. Baruch atah Yahweh noten ha Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth, has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. All right, let me just reset here for a second. All right, we're going to go through some quick announcements here. I may be a little rusty. I haven't done this in a while. I try to keep it to at least 45 minutes, okay? No. <laughs> you guys are like, be like, can we have Grayson back? All right, so I do want to welcome our guests. Let's welcome the guests. All right, fantastic. So especially if you're a guest online, we do want you to feel welcome because maybe you just found us on the sidebar, or however you found us, you know, from YouTube's recommendation. So welcome, welcome. Hopefully there's something here that might be useful to you and bless you. Of course, if you are a guest, we ask that you would, you know, behave like a guest, you know, because we have people do come in sometimes and they forget that they're guests and they start <laughs> like drive-by shooting at us and stuff. So please behave like a guest. Look, we don't expect you to agree with and like everything that we do. Okay, we expect that this may not be the way everybody thinks it should be done, and that's okay. We ask that you be Yeshua-like and behave Yeshua-like when you're doing your disagreement. Okay, so you don't like what you see, you could always just watch something else. You could always contact us to discuss it. Okay, attacking us online is probably not Yeshua-like. Right, just pointing that out. All right, now, so for all of you that just found us, we do stream twice a week. So we sh every Shabbat, every Saturday at 1.15 Eastern time, we go live right here on YouTube. Actually, the stream starts at 1. We go live at 1.15. So there's 15 minutes of music, clips from teachings, and announcement slides like these. Okay? So 1.15 Eastern time, we blow the shofar and start the service live. You're welcome to join us for that. It's not like other services. We try to actually be as interactive as possible. So, because I've watched some live streams and there's no, they have no idea that I'm watching. There's no interaction really. But we do have a chat. Well, you might say, well, other people have a chat. But we actually interact with the chat and even let you ask questions from the chat and send a prayer request from the chat. So we do interact with you in a much more direct way than a lot of people do. And that's not bragging or anything. I'm just letting you know that we're trying to meet that need. All right, now, service does run until about 5.30, so it's a little over four hours, so it is a long haul, but you know what? What else you got to do on a Shabbat? <laughs> what better thing can it be to spend time with each other, with mishpacha, with family, and getting into the Word? And so we do that on Saturdays, every Saturday, with a few exceptions during the year, during feasts, okay? So we may have it at a slightly different time. We still stream, it just may be at a slightly different time. All right, then on Tuesdays, like we are right now, every Tuesday is Torah Study Tuesday. Starts at 6.30, so a little over half an hour ago we started, and it runs, well, it just runs until. <laughs> until I finish, whatever that is, all right? But usually about three hours at the most, about 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, like last week. Who knows, okay? Hopefully we're not in too much of a rush. And for those of you that it's too late, then, you know, because it goes too long, it's recorded. You can always pick it up the next day and watch what you missed. Okay, so that's on YouTube, live twice a week. And the same thing with the Torah study is with the Sabbath. Sometimes that Tuesday night may be scheduled a little bit differently just because it's during a feast time. All right, now we have a program for the children called Parsha Pearls. It's a fantastic program. I'm not biased at all considering my wife put it together, but it is fantastic. 
<laughs> okay? So tremendous program by Rebitz and Julie and her incredible team who put together this incredibly robust program so that our children can study the word in, in, at a level that's appropriate for them. In other words, it's, it's written for them to enjoy at their level, understand at their level, okay? Now, that being said, okay, so the program is, is on our, its own separate website. Sorry, I got distracted because somebody walked in. Let's not give the new people distracting Maria. Let's not, yeah, you just disturbed the entire place because you had to get up and walk over there. Let's not do that, okay? They'll still be here after the Torah study, and you can say hello then. All right, so this is one of those things we all need to learn. You can end up in a, I'm not accusing you of being selfish, but that was a selfish moment. You wanted to get up, you wanted to run over, but everybody else is trying to pay attention, and you distracted me. Let's not do that. All right, so the Partial Growth Program has its own website. YMTY.org, Young Messianic Torah Observant Israelites.org. So YMTY.org. On that site, every Sunday we post that week's Torah portion. So what we did today, Rie posted a couple of days ago on Sunday. So that way you have it all week long to go through with your children. You can use it for homeschooling. You can use it for Sabbath school. We use it here for Sabbath school on the following Shabbat. Okay, so what we're just doing tonight, what was put together, it was posted on Sunday, we'll be doing on Shabbat with the children here. All right, so what do you get with that program? There's two, actually. Two programs. They're free. By the way, everything that I'm offering you here is free, okay? <laughs> Just so I don't have to keep saying that, we're not selling anything. So these programs, all teachings, all instruction from me is free. Now, so we broke it up, the children, into two groups. The younger one, ages 5 through 8. We call them gem seekers. The older ones, pearl seekers, 9 through about 19. That also includes... Um, it's really two groups in there, 9 to 12s and the 13 to 19s. These are PDFs that you can download. Each PDF, each is 35 or so pages. Every week, filled with this robust amount of material. We're talking about child-friendly stories that have to do with that week's Torah portion. Actually, let me say this up front. Everything I'm about to list is Torah portion specific for that week. None of it is just to fill it up with stuff to do. Everything in there, whether it's a craft or a puzzle, are all for that Torah portion, okay? So you got child-friendly stories and lessons from that Torah portion, lesson questions, Hebrew word studies, a couple of words on flashcards you could cut out from the study, memory verses, word searches, crossword puzzles, mazes, crafts, notebook pages, coloring pages, even a song and a snack. Wow, it's a lot of stuff. You're thinking, a song, a snack? Or maybe a song with a snack? Okay, we did the Ten Commandments. Right? And so what do we do for the Ten Commandments? We had to make a Torah scroll with pretzel sticks and fruit roll up and I don't know what else, but it was edible. Okay? So they made a nice little Torah scroll. So we find some way to do something, to depict something from the Torah portion and make it into something they can eat. Okay? So they have a, a really good time with all this. So it's ymty.org. Enjoy it. It's called Parsha Pearls. Fantastic program. If you have any questions about it, you can email rebitson at parshapearls at mty.org. I think that's, that's the email for it, parshapearls at mty.org. All right. Let's see. Then we have audio scripture readings by our own Shearer Wendling. So if you want to hear the word read, she does a great job. We have it, all of it from Genesis to Revelation on our website, on the mty.org main website under media, under audio scripture readings. So you can enjoy that. It's free, downloadable. And the first five books are broken up by Torah portions. So you could actually listen to that week's Torah portion if you'd like to. All right, then we post every day during the week on YouTube. On Mondays, we post what's called The First Look, which is like a movie preview for the big movie that's coming out. This is the preview for the teaching that's coming out on Wednesday. So Mondays is The First Look. Powerful sound bites from the teaching to kind of get you kind of hyped up and ready and excited for the full teaching. Then on Tuesday, we post... We're using the new format that YouTube has called YouTube Shorts, and so we do MTOI Shorts. So these are all one minute or a little bit shorter videos that post on Tuesday, so we post 10 of those. So it gives you plenty of little, you know, little videos to watch. And then on Wednesday is the full teaching. Okay, so this week's teaching is continuing the series of Be Set Apart. Okay, I don't know what part we're up to there with what's being posted, but anyway, the current series is Be Set Apart. And so you get the full teaching on Wednesday. Now, every week when I teach, we take questions afterwards and we record them. We call this the afterburn and we post that on Thursday. Okay, so that's 
almost as long, sometimes longer than the teaching was. It's an opportunity for me to take whatever I said, get feedback from you, and then even make more clarifications on something that maybe in the feedback wasn't as clear as I'd hoped it was during the teaching. So it's, it's, it makes the teaching that much more deep, full, complete, understandable, all of that. So those are posted on Thursdays. Then on Friday, we post what's called an in-focus. Okay, these are short videos to focus on topics that affect our relationship with each other and with our Elohim. And so these are like little mini teachings that were inside of a bigger teaching. So like, let's say I taught for 70 minutes and I went off on a seven or eight minute rabbi trail into something that when you pull it out, it holds its own as an interesting little separate te mini teaching. Okay, and when you watch these, it'll also let you know on the screen what teaching it came out of. Because you might want to go back and watch the whole thing. Okay? All right, live programming. So now we're back from the YouTube stuff to live programming on Tuesday, I mean, excuse me, on Thursdays. Every Thursday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we have Torah time for teens. Okay, we might actually start changing this to Torah teens. We'll just call them the Torah teens, okay? Um, and this is hosted by our own Rabbi Tom Mitchell. All right. Okay, and so that's on Thursdays at 1 o'clock. It's hosted using the platform Zoom. Okay, so you need a link for that to go to the room. Send us an email at torahtime at mtoi.org, and that's an autoresponder that will send you the link to the, to the room, okay? Same link works every week, so you don't need a new one, all right? So Torah time for teens is going to be on Thursdays, 1 o'clock. We have teens from all over the world that come and attend. We've had over 30-something now, almost every week, 35 or so. It's fantastic. Um, it is for teens, though, okay? So please, let's keep the younger children out of the room, because remember, this is a video chat. And our goal is two things. Well, three things, really. Number one, we would like the teenagers to learn something. Number two, we want them to feel comfortable to be themselves and ask questions and not worry about somebody judging their questions or whether or not it's something they should be asking, et cetera. And number three, we want them to interact with each other, okay, and get to know each other a little bit. And Rabbi Tom does a great job of hosting this and creating that environment. So what that means is if you are teenagers are going into this room, it helps if you keep the room empty of anybody else and just let them do the, do the class. No younger ones under 13, no older ones over 19. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but I want to know what they're doing. Fine. Come into the room. Don't go on camera because you can hear what's going on. Because as soon as you go in the room, two things are going to happen. If you're on camera, everybody will start editing what they're doing. If you're not on camera, just your teenager will. <laughs> okay, so let's le let the teenagers have their time. Now, I have no problem with you wondering what's going on. Come in, check on them, and then leave. But please allow them the freedom to do what they're doing. Okay. I assure you, Rabbi Tom is doing a great job, okay? Let's see. Then we have our zone meetings. All right, so the zone meetings, is, these are my best way, my best effort to meet the needs internationally when it's still Shabbat where they live. We have a lot of people all over the world, and I want to do something with them, especially answer their questions. Because contrary to Christianity's belief or Messianic's belief that the Ruach answers all your questions, somehow that hasn't been working. <laughs> Maybe it's because it doesn't work that way. All right? People have a lot of questions. Some of those questions are because they really just want to know. Some of them is because they want to know what my opinion is on them so they can figure me out. Well, what's your take on this and what's your stance on that? So we do this in these zone meetings because it's a, it's a range of time zones. That's where I got the name from. In case anybody says, where do you come up with zone meetings? Well, we got covering time zones. So it's an international Shabbat Q&A with me. So zone one meets the first Saturday every month. So it's easy to remember, Zone 1, first Saturday. It's the U.S., Canada, Mexico, South America, and Central America is Zone 1. But really, we're going to change that. The Zone 1 first meeting is really just if you are here living in Cleveland, Tennessee, or visiting, and you're here physically in the building. Okay? So I should say this up front. As I cover the three different Zone meetings, everybody's welcome to attend all three. Actually, there's four now because I have a double thing for Zone 1. The people that live in the targeted zone that week, they're the ones that get to ask the questions. Okay, that's the only difference. Everybody is welcome to attend. We average now over 130 computers on there. So it's fantastic from all over the world. 
And a lot of times you can see them. They've got their cameras on. And you've got a whole family sitting there watching or a bunch of people gathered together. So probably that 130, easily five, 600 people. Okay? So, so the, we need to change the slide, I guess, for the zone one to explain that this is only for the local people, the first zone one. It's live during Shabbat services in the same slot where normally I would teach, like in the teaching time, which is around 2.30, 3 o'clock, I guess, in the afternoon, right, by the time we get to that. All right. So that's zone one. Then we get to zone two. Now, all the rest of the zone meetings are on Zoom. And the link for that is zoom at mtoi.org. And it's, again, it's an autoresponder. We'll send you a link. All right, so zone two is the UK, Europe, and Africa. These are the places that are like six, seven, eight hours ahead of us, nine hours ahead of us, okay? And that's the second Saturday of every month. The next one being September the 10th. And so that will be at 10 a.m., Think about it. They're six hours ahead. 10 a.m. is about four in the afternoon for them. Okay. So we can, we can make sure to get that in while it's still Shabbat where they are. All right. That's the UK, Europe, and Africa on Zoom. All of you are invited to the meeting. Then because Zone 1 is so big and we have the people here live who have a lot of questions, we wanted to give the people, we did this last week for the first time and it was fantastic, right? The Zoom Zone 1. So... This is on the third Friday of the month. I know it's a zone one, but we're also doing zone three the same day. So the Zoom zone one is the U.S., Canada, Mexico, South Central Americas, um, all the islands that are in the same time zone ranges. They're going to meet on Friday night, September the 16th, the third Friday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern time, immediately followed by zone three which will be at 10 p.m. Zone three is Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the Philippines. Oh, let's see, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, China, Fiji. Okay, so we've got a lot of places covered out there. India, and these are all places that are 12 to 16 or 17 hours ahead of us here. And so we start at 10 o'clock in the evening on Friday, which is still Saturday morning or Saturday early afternoon where they are, all right? And again, you're all welcome and invited to all these meetings. Just remember, the people who live in those areas are the ones who are going to be getting to ask the questions for that meeting. Now, let's say you don't want to ask a question in front of everybody, but you still have questions. You can email us, okay, if you have questions, or you can send it to us through our contact page. I need to change the slide. There we go. So, okay, so go to mty.org slash contact dash us. Okay, our contact us page, and scroll down to the bottom of the page. There's a form you can fill out. Or you could just email us your question by emailing questions at mty.org. All right, if you have an urgency, like a question that you need to get answered in a, like two, three, four days is your window of time that you need this answer for, after which we'll have missed whatever it is that you needed to make a decision about, please mark your question urgent. And then we'll try to get to it quickly. If you mark something urgent and it actually isn't urgent, meaning like time sensitive, but it's just something that you really, really you know, want to know, we will bounce you to the back of the line, okay? Because that's not being respectful of our need to try to get to the urgent ones that actually are urgent, okay? Okay, something just happened. You need to make a decision about something that's going to be going on in two days. That's urgent. Something's been bothering you for 20 years is annoying. It's not urgent, Okay? So you really want to get it answered finally, but it's not urgent, okay? We will try to get to those non-urgent questions as quick as we can as well. All right, now let's go look at the things coming up on our calendar of the events. So we start off with coming up our Rosh Kodesh for the month of Elul. Okay, so Mr. Grayson, it's Elul, not Elul. Okay, just so you know. Okay, so when you're up here next time, it's Elul. Okay, long you. Okay, Elul. So the month of Elul, we're going to be starting that, Rosh Kodesh. We're going to be doing it. Now that's on a Shabbat. So we're going to be, after sundown is when the first of the month begins. So we're going to do it after the Oneg at 8.30. So when sundown is early enough then, so we can go ahead and wait for the sun to go down. Then we're going to start because that Sunday is actually Elul 1. Okay? So that Saturday night, after we finish our service, finish our meal, and then we'll go ahead and reset everything to at 8.30, we'll do a live service. For you guys on live stream, we will be streaming at 8.30, okay? That will be for the Rosh Kodesh, the new moon of the month of Elul. We should be getting excited because that means we're only one month away from Rosh Hashanah. I mean, that's, it's coming right up. It's coming right up. Oh, um, 
I need I need to make sure that Marty and I I got to get get this challenge together that I want to do for the month of the lul. So we'll have to get that figured out and announce that here, like maybe on Shabbat. Okay. Um, then we have our next Erev Shabbat get together. Okay, once a month we get together for Erev Shabbat <laughs> with the Mishpacha. Mishpacha means family. That's on the first Friday of the month. Okay, almost always. Sometimes we don't because of things back to back kind of jamming us up a little bit, but we are doing it almost always on the first Friday of the month. That'll be September 2nd, and that's at 7 o'clock, okay? So all of you that are here, you know the, the routine. You'll show up with your food. It's just like we do on Shabbat. Bring your own food ready to go, and we'll get set. We'll do our Erev Shabbat service at 7. We'll start eating probably about 7.20, 7.30, and then we'll fellowship and enjoy bringing in the Shabbat together. Okay, so that's on September 2nd. Can't believe it's September already. All right, then September 11th, we have our next Leadership Council meeting. All right. And so please keep the leaders in prayer. We meet once a month. The leadership is not, we're not just talking about local leadership here. We're talking about leadership around the world, representing over 25 or so congregations and small home fellowships and little groups together that all are part of MTUI. And we just have, a, they all have such a great heart. I'm so proud of them to be able to work together to serve the body as effectively as possible on behalf of the Father. Right? We don't have our own agenda here. So please pray for these meetings, that, they, that our hearts would be right, that we talk about all the things that need to be talked about, that Abba would inspire us with the answers that we need to address or to plan or to provide whatever it is you need. Okay? Um, if you want to make suggestions, you can always let us know suggestions of things that, that you feel like would be great. Hey, it'd be great if you guys did this or provided that or whatever it is. Let us know, and we can always bring it up at a meeting and, and see how that goes. By the way, just so this is clear, because some of you may not understand this, um, this is not a voting council. Okay? So in case some of you might be thinking, oh, well, if I get a hold of some of those guys and I don't like what Rabbi's doing, it's not going to help you. Okay? This is not a voting council. I have the burden of responsibility to make all the decisions. I do that, though, with counsel. It is a council. It's a leadership council. They're there to give their thoughts and their, their opinions and to bring up issues and bring up suggestions of solutions and all that kind of good stuff. However, it's my responsibility to make the decisions. So that's why I want you to pray for the council. But just in case somebody might be thinking, oh, if I don't know who those guys are, it won't help you. If that's your agenda, that won't make any difference, okay? All right. We do have in the Leadership Council the vertical structure that I talk about all the time, okay? And they, everybody in that council respects that where they are in that structure, okay? But from an accountability point of view, they all know what I'm doing. They all have come to agreement about what I'm, with the choices that I make because my job is not just to make choices but to also convince them why it's the right choice at the time. It's not one of those because I said so, I'm in charge. Okay, that has never come out of my mouth at a council meeting. It's always my job to say, are we all in agreement? No, then we need to keep talking about it until I find the right way to explain or show you or demonstrate why this is necessary. Okay? Which really has never taken very much because the council discussions always are, the decisions I make make sense almost right away to everybody, okay? Because it, it, it becomes clear, just like when I teach you guys, when I explain to them the reasoning, they understand it very clearly because it's coming from above. Okay. So I've never really explained it to you guys before, but I thought it might be helpful. All right. September, maybe there was just somebody out there thinking of doing that other thing, and that's why I addressed it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like the guy going, somebody out there is having a marriage problem. Send your $1,000 seat. Okay. No, so somebody out there might have been thinking, oh, there's a way to get around, Rabbi. No. We're not Baptists, okay? We don't have a deacon's board that's going to tell the pastor what to do. Okay, that doesn't happen. All right. See, some of you who aren't Baptists don't know what I'm talking about. But No, the pastor in the, is not the leader. The deacon's board of the leadership. And they could fire him and hire him at any time they want. Okay? He has no power at all. And I know this because I spoke to one on a regular basis when we were renting a building from one of them. And he was so frustrated because... He didn't really have any power, you know? He was a hireling, and he knew it, too, and he was frustrated. I said, so stop being a hireling. Take charge of this group. Let them fire you. Go start something else properly. Why are you being a hireling? 
So he was kind of envious of my position. Anyway, September the 26th is Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. All right, so it's Tishrei 1, so it's the Rosh Kodesh for the month of Tishrei. It is also Rosh Hashanah. It's also Yom Truah, Zikron Truah. So many different ways you can always call this day. For those of you out there already having a meltdown because I called it Rosh Hashanah, get over it. Look, that part of the problem is that we have a lot of self-appointed you know, scholars out there that think that they know everything. And so before you... This is what all of you should do. Before you react to anything, you should find out why. Well, why do I call it that? Maybe there's a reason. And so Rosh Hashanah, what does that mean? It means head of the years. Okay, head of the year. Now, so you'll say, oh, no, the beginning of the year is in the month of Aviv. That's true. If you're counting months. When you're counting years, though, like we read today about the Shemitah count in this Torah portion. You read about the Jubilee count in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 23 is the calendar for the months, but Leviticus 25 says that in the month of Tishrei, after Yom Kippur, you declare the Jubilee. That's where you're counting years. So it's the head of the count for years is where Rosh Hashanah. The head of the count for months is Aviv. Two different calendars in the same world that we function in. We actually, we're so used to using only one calendar. They used more than one. Okay, one for counting years and one for counting months. So this is the seventh month in the monthly calendar. It's the first in the counting of years. It's when we count years from. It's not really that confusing. So anyway, so Rosh Hashanah is an appropriate name for it. Some people say, well, that's the civil new year, this and that. Listen, if you want to think of civil from the idea of that's what Jubilees and Shemitahs are about, then yes. Not civil like some government in 1948 decided to do this or something. Okay? It's not civil like from a, you know, a secular governmental point of view. But when you're dealing with things of the, of the uh, people, the civil stuff, like returning people stuff or giving them freedom, etc., like we do with the Shemitah, the, the year of release or the Jubilees, yes. So this is the counting of years. So we're going to be meeting here at 1.15, our normal time, having our special Rosh Hashanah service, okay? It's tradition, it's a minhag, it's a tradition to wear, at least that's what we've been doing lately, to wear like blue, royal blue or purple that day as we're kind of crowning the king. Okay, that's the kind of the symbology of Rosh Hashanah, all right? Um, you do not have to wear these things, but I've had people get mad at me because I didn't say it, so now I'm saying it. All right. <laughs> All right, then we have Yom Kippur. Yay! All right, that's 10 days later. We got Yom Kippur on October the 5th. That's a Wednesday. Rosh Hashanah was on a Monday. All right, Yom Kippur is on a Wednesday, October the 5th. That's a day of complete fasting. The tradition is to wear white on Yom Kippur. All right? And so you can do that. Now, so this is a day where you're not going to be eating or drinking anything from sundown Tuesday night to sundown Wednesday night, all right? And we will be breaking the fast. If you would like, you can break the fast with us right here in the building. Bring your food with you on Wednesday. Don't taste it or sample it. And then bring it into the back, and we'll leave it there during the service, and we'll bring it out like we normally do for Oneg, okay? And we'll break the fast together. Now, we will be breaking the fast when I say it's time to break the fast, okay? I don't need anybody else checking their watch and their phone and figuring out when sundown is. I will let you know the sundown we are using, okay? And that's when I feel it's actually right and dark, I will say, yes, but now we can eat, okay? So you wait for that. Make sure your children know that they're all going to wait for Rabbi to make the decision. Okay, so that service is going to be a little bit later because of the fact that we're going to break the fast. I don't have the time on here. I got to remember, based on when sundown is, I'll figure out the math and how short the service is. So I will be remembering to put that hopefully in my notes for, where's my pen? All right, let me write that down. I got to do the, I got to do a 30-day challenge, and I got to do Yom Kippur time. 
Okay, I'll get that for Saturday's announcements on Shabbat, okay? Because I'm going to try to schedule it so that you show up here, we have the service, we set up for the own egg, and then it's time. All right, so get it as close to that as possible. Again, these are short services. They're going to be much more traditional in feel and flavor to what you'd get in a synagogue. No, it will not be a synagogue service, but it'll have a lot of the elements and feelings and flavors of that. And so it's a, uh, like when we do for Rosh Kodesh, where everything's on the screen, it's going to be the same thing, except that when we do Rosh Kodesh, it's 15 minutes. This is going to be more like an hour and a half to two hours, okay? So everything's going to be up on the screen, and we'll follow along. There will be some praise and songs that we will be singing together, uh, led by the praise team, or at least I know for sure by Brianna and, and uh, Marty, and we'll get that all worked out. And so if you've been to our services before, you know what we're in for and how that's going to work. I just want to figure out if it's about, when I look at last year and the year before, how long the service runs, and then we'll start that much before sundown, give or take a little bit extra just to give us time to set up. All right. Then we have Sukkot. All right, and because Marlene just got back, I'm cutting her slack by telling me we're still at 3.30 plus because she did not know the number that we are up to. Okay. <laughs> um, but we have over 330 people coming, so that's very exciting. Okay, I expect it'll be over 400. Don't forget that September 23rd is our deadline. You need to get your registrations in and get things paid for by September 23rd, please. Okay? Now, um, to register, you can go online to our website, mtui.org slash Sukkot, or just look for the drop-down link or the, on the marquee there on the homepage for Sukkot. There's a form you can fill out right there on the site. It doesn't automatically send it to us. You still have to, you know, save it onto your computer and then print it out and mail it to us, or you can, there's an upload button right there where the download was on our website. So after you save it to your computer, you can upload it back up into that link with your name and email address, and then it will send it to us, okay? Um, there's a GiveLify button there. If you're doing things for payments for Sukkot, there's an envelope that actually says Sukkot 2022. Use that one, please. Don't use other. Don't use offerings. There's one that says Sukkot 2022, okay? There is one that says feast offerings. That's for an offering you make during the feast. That's not for paying for your feasts, okay? All right, this makes our accounting a lot easier because you don't get credit tax-wise for things like purchasing meals for a feast. You do get credit tax-wise if you want to file this in your taxes for offerings. And so we have to account for things correctly. And so put it in as Sukkot 2022, or we won't know that that was the right thing it was for. It's harder for us to find it and give you the credit, okay? All right, is there anything else on my list here? Please make Marlene's job, please make Marlene, no, it doesn't say that. Please make Marlene's job easier. She is very good at trying to make sure that she has payments, paperwork, and all these things put together. So if you are aware that you've only sent one or the other, you need to send both. Um, if you did not get an email from her saying, we have received your payment, that means that either we didn't receive it or you didn't mark it correctly and we didn't know. So just get in touch with us and make sure that we have it marked right. It's easy enough for us to find where the place it was put wrong was once you tell us, but we just have to look for it, okay? If you know what the date was of the check or how you paid for it on Givelify or whatever, we can usually find it even if you marked it incorrectly and then give you the right credit, okay? All right. So anybody out there, you always can just contact us, and she'd be very happy to check on your status and let you know what we think your balance is, et cetera. All right. I think that's going to cover it for the announcements. You guys are a little bit too happy that we're done with the announcements. You're like, yay, it's about time he's done with the announcements. Bring Grayson back out here. All right, so we're going to go through the Torah portion. You guys ready? There's a lot here. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is rie, which means see or behold. All right, so beginning in verses right, right here at the beginning on 26 through 28, right? Let me get to the right verses here. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse, the blessing when you obey the commands of Yahweh Elohim, which I command you today, and the curse 
If you do not obey the commands of Yahweh, your Elohim, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other mighty ones which you have not known. All right. So the blessing when you obey, but not just when you obey. When you obey that which Moshe commanded. Because he makes that point. He says, when you obey the commands of Yahweh, which I command you. Okay, so it's not just, I just, you know, because a lot of messianics today, especially more even than the Christians who come into Torah observance, because Christians aren't doing Torah, they feel like Yahweh leads them and they just kind of know what he obey, you know, what to obey, what he tells them. It doesn't say that anywhere here. The expectation is blessing comes from obeying what Moses said on Yahweh's behalf, what Yahweh said through Moshe. Okay? Okay, so... I want you to understand, like, I want you to read so you can hear what this looks like in the Hebrew, right? It says, Habracha, Asher, Tishmu, El Mitzvot, Yahweh Elohechem. All right? I wrote this in too small a type on my paper. Listen to what it's saying here. Habracha, all right, Bracha, blessing, right? Baruch Atah, blessed are you. Okay? Asher, Tishmu, Shmu. So what is this? It's the Shema. So he's not saying, when he says obey, it's still the Shema at the root of that. Hearing and doing translates obey. All right? So in the Hebrew, it's still the Shema. Okay? And then it says, El Mitzvot, the Mitzvot, the commandments. Okay? So that's, the blessing comes, the bracha comes, when you guard and keep, when you hear and do the commandments, the obeying. This is not shamar here. This is hearing and doing. Shamar would be guarding. We have that later in other verses. Then it says, the curse if you do not obey. So you get a curse when you don't do what Moses said. This is not, because people talked about, you know, well, I'm just going to do, I just do what God tells me to do. Well, he told you through Moses. That's what Scripture is telling you here, okay? So on that side, it's the same thing. In the, in the Hebrew, it says, lo tishmu, lo meaning that you don't shema. You're not doing these things. All right? Why the curse? Why is he cursing people? Perhaps because your lack of shema, your disobedience is evidence that you have chosen another mighty one to listen to and obey. Because look, it goes, interestingly, it's strange, because it starts off with, I lay before you the blessing when you obey, the curse when you don't obey. Ah, but turn... Aside from the way which I command you, the way, right? What, what is the way? Ah, Yeshua is the way. John 14, 6. Yeshua says, I am the way. And so we also know he's the Torah. So the Torah is the way. When you turn aside from the way which I command you today, that means you're not keeping or not guarding and not doing the commandments. And then it says to go after the mighty ones which you have not known. So the... the inference that could be taken from reading this is that you decided to go after all the mighty ones, so you stopped keeping. No. You stopped keeping because somebody else is now holding a higher spot in your vertical. That probably is you more than any other mighty one. Okay? Because you are going to always be the slave to whom you serve, whether it's self, Hasatan, or the Almighty. Okay, so let's read that in the right way, because otherwise you might, you might think, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not going after any pagan idols and stuff. No, the whole point is that you don't obey because you've allowed someone else to be the one you're obeying. And it's almost always going to be you. Well, I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to do it. Or I like this, and I don't care what he says, I'm going to do it anyway. So that's not you all of a sudden worshiping Dagon or Chemosh or Molech or something, right? No, that's just you being self-sovereign. But it's the problem is in the causing you to break, not keep, not Shema. Okay, that's where we end up with the problem here. Amen? Okay. So then we get to verses 29 and 30, the blessing that's put on Mount Gerizim and the cursing on Mount Ebal. All okay? right, so what's that all about? All right, so you got two mountains. They're like twins facing each other across a valley, the valley where Shechem was in that valley, okay? 
And as they were crossing in, one mountain, Mount Gerizim, is lush and fruitful and gets the blessings on it. And they speak, again, the curses on Abel, which is barren and rocky. Now, they didn't become that way because of the blessing and the curse. They're there to be a visual to remind you, blessing, lush, fruitful. Cursing, barren, and rocky. So when they look, they were there to be, oh, I see that. I know what it's supposed to memory trigger. Just look, you wear seat seat, right? Why do you wear the seat seat? It's a memory trigger to keep the commandments. So when they would see these two big mountains that were next to each other across a valley, right? Not next to each other. They were facing each other across a valley. That one represented cursing, one represented blessing. Okay? So that's what you have going on there with those two mountains. Okay. Verses 31 and 32. For you are passing over the Arden to go in and possess the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you. And you shall possess it and dwell in it and shall guard to do all the laws and right rulings which I am setting before you today. So the emphasis here is you are passing over. Okay, so passing over should also have this idea that crossing over like with Avraham, like a Hebrew, like he crossed over. It should also have the idea of Passover, like the, the observance of the idea that the, the death passed over them. They're passing or passing from death into life. There's a lot of this idea of passing over. They're leaving the world and going into the land, so to speak. The next idea is that they're going to go in. You're passing over and you're going in, which is something they didn't actually get excited to do initially. Remember, they balked at it when the spies had their bad moment. Okay? So passing over, going in. So I'm kind of giving you the process here. So you pass from death into life. Then you have to go in. So that means you have to actively start to, in, the, in our walk, we're kind of always going to put this in a package of what can we do with this today. So then, okay, so you, you realize that, like we were just reading in Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses, right? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, dead in your trespasses. And now you're passing over into life. And then he says, I want you to go in. So you go in and you accept and you start to receive life. And then he says, I want you to possess all right, the next phase is possessing it, right? Passing over, going and possessing. In other words, taking ownership that this is for me. Not like this is mine, I can do whatever I want with it, but this is for me. This is where the discovering your identity teaching is so important. When you realize as an Israelite, all of this is actually for you. Okay, because it's for Israel and you get to be a part of that. Okay, regardless of whether you were born into it or not, right? So you go in, and then you possess. And then he wants you to dwell in. These are all the phrases that are right here. He says, go in, possess the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you, and you shall possess it and dwell in it. So now he wants you to dwell in it. What's that mean? Live it. Walk it. Dwell in it. Because you could take possession of something and then say it's mine and I own it, but I'm going to go over here and do something else, but that's still mine over there. It's not like a rental property. Okay? He wants you to dwell in this. This is, you know what? Torah is owner occupied. Okay? It's not a rental property. You're going to go into the land and then you're going to possess it and then you're going to dwell in it. And then he says, you're going to, since you're dwelling there and you do all the things, you're going to guard. Why do you need to guard? Because you could get to what we read in the Birkat HaMazon in Deuteronomy 8. You could eat and be satisfied and forget how you ended up with all the good stuff in the first place. While you're dwelling in it and it's all wonderful, you can become complacent. You can become complacent. And so he says, next after that, if we read in verse 32, it says, and you shall guard to do all the laws. After saying dwell in at the end of 31. So you're going to guard and do all the laws and the right rulings which I'm setting before you today. All right, so here's the emphasis. You're going to pass over, go in, possess, dwell in, and then guard to do all the mitzvot, the commandments that Moshe set before them. Okay? All right. Let's go to chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Completely destroy all the places where the nations which are, you are dispossessing serve their mighty ones. 
on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall break down their altars and smash their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. And you shall cut down the carved image of the mighty ones and shall destroy their name out of that place. All right, so what does that look like today? Well, it doesn't look like this literally. You're not going into pagan places and burning them to the ground. Because the literal was when that nation, Israel, was going in to dispossess the nations from the land and to possess the land, to clean house. So what's the deeper sort of meaning for us? How can we apply this in us? It has to do with when you go in and you possess and you dwell, you need to make sure that you have destroyed all of the paganism in your world, in your house, in your life. You need to clean house. I mean, that's essentially what they were doing when they were going to the land. They were cleaning house. They were getting it all out of there. Not just getting rid of the people out of there, but also anything from them that could tempt you to seek him in a wrong way or worship him in a wrong way or do. This is a section where we're going to get a lot of do not do as they do. All right? Do not do as they do and do not do what's right in your own eyes. Matter of fact, that's what it says in verse 4. Do not do so to Yahweh your Elohim. Now, He's not saying don't break down Yahweh's stuff. He's saying don't do their stuff to me. See, the biggest problem, I know a lot of times we, we think, eh, I don't have any pagan stuff. I don't have any idols, so I'm good. No. If you're still treating him or worshiping him in a manner that's not his manner but another system's manner or way of doing it, you're still breaking this. Because his point is, do not do to me. He's not just telling you the obvious thing, don't go do to them. Don't go worship their gods. But don't take that that you see them doing and now say it's about me. Don't do their thing and claim it's mine, which is Christianity's whole big problem. That's where Christmas and Easter come from, okay? Doing something that was done for other peoples and then syncretizing it in, Okay? That's the word, syncretize. I didn't say synchronize wrong. It's not synchronizing. It's syncretizing is taking two things that really don't belong together and merging them together into one thing. And so the paganism was brought into the system. Now, so let's understand that what this looks like today is you need to literally, listen to what it says, completely destroy all the places in you and your life where the nations, where you were, grew up and where you were raised, had done all these things and you were imitating the behavior, the thinking patterns, the vertical focus in their way, not his way. That needs to get wiped out in your life, okay? Break down all of the altars and smash the... In other words, it's not just, well, I don't own anything like that, fine. But where are those things in you? Look at it as a type and shadow of us a more hidden or sowed understanding. Maybe it's Ramez that's hinting at what's going on in you. What's going on in you that needs to be broken down? Look, you guys counsel with me on a regular basis, and there's often enough occasions where it's something you have not let go of yet. It's something you haven't broken down and destroyed yet that was from the old you. Now, don't tell me you're a new you and you still have this old you thinking. You might have come out into a new you behavior-wise. Well, I don't do Sunday anymore, and I don't eat the way I used to, and I keep holy days now, and I don't do Christmas. And I, okay, good for you. That, I'm not picking on That's great. I'm glad you do all that. But if you still think like you used to and believe like you used to, see, this is why people don't understand that I get a little bit petibed. I get a little petibed. I get a little disturbed. When I watch people in the quote-unquote messianic, Hebrew roots, whatever, and sure, they're, they're moved over to Saturday. Sure, they're keeping the feasts, kind of. They're not doing the pagan days, good. But everything else about their thinking and their vertical approach is still Christianity. They didn't tear all this stuff down. Do you not know that you are the dwelling place? Verse, what, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that you're the dwelling place? Well, then you can't have that junk in that dwelling place. You got to clean that house out. All right. 
Not that I'm very passionate about that or anything. All right, so verse 4, he says, Do not do so to Yahweh your Elohim, but seek the place which Yahweh Elohim chooses out of the tribes to put his name there for his dwelling place, and then you shall enter. And there you shall take your burnt offerings and all these things with the offerings then. In verse 7, and there you shall eat before Yahweh. Okay, now, so what's it talking about here? What does it look like today? Well, first of all, it's do not do as they do. Right? He says, do not do as they do. He literally says that. All right, now, as we're going through that do not do as you do, he's saying you cannot do offerings and these things just anywhere. All right, you cannot do that. You cannot just set up something in your backyard Look at verse 13. We'll just jump over there real quickly. Guard yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, except in the place where Yahweh chooses in one of your tribes. There you are to offer these things. So what does that look like today? Well, first of all, we're not sacrificing any animals. We don't have a place like this to do it. There is no officially sanctioned places to do these things. And no, for all you geniuses out there that are putting blood on your doorposts and, and, you know, for Passover, that was done once. Please stop, okay? Because I literally have had conversations, maybe it's been eight years since I had a person call me, all freaked out because their congregation was literally slaughtering a lamb, putting the blood on their doorposts, and doing the whole, you know, Passover offering thing, which you cannot do in your house or your backyard or at your local, wherever you go. Not according to Torah. We just read it. You can't do it. Okay, so you need to stop it. You got to knock that off. You just cannot do that. So he says there, so it says you need to go and do these things. Now, we're going to get to chapter 14, which talks about tithing and offerings. Now, when we get there, and we're talking about a little bit here in 12, what that also means is you don't take your, I have people saying, they send me a check and they say, I, have, I just found you guys and I wanted to send you some of my tithe. Um, okay, thank you, but that's not the way it's done. If you're going to send your tithe, all of it goes to one place, and that's the place that you believe Yahweh's placed his name, where you're getting fed. Because I've, I've met people that told me, oh, yeah, I send a little bit to this teacher and a little bit to that one. This is how I do my tithing. I send it to 12 different places. That's offerings, if anything. That's not tithing. We're going to read, as we get through this, not to forsake the Levite and understand that you need to take care of the Levite. That's the priest who stands before you because they have no inheritance. That's what the tithing is for. It's not to be spread around because you like a bunch of people. That may, you can do that if you want to make offerings. You can give anybody a gift. You want to give a gift to people and say, hey, listen, I really appreciate your teaching. Good. Don't call it the tithe, though. Because here he says, he says, you do not. Okay, you do not do these things. He says, you're going to go into the place Yahweh chooses, and there you're going to bring your burnt offerings, your tithes, and, all, and it says your offerings and your tithes, and your contributions. These things are all to go to that one place. Not just wherever you feel like sending it. See, I think sometimes we do things because we're not Torah aware, so we don't know that some things he actually tells us matter. Like, don't do this the way they do this. And I'm sure the people that have been doing it the other way had no idea this verse was here and not even applied to them. But you should not be doing these things. It says it right here. All right. Verse 8 and 9. Do not do as we are doing here today, each one doing what is right in his own eyes. <laughs> we already just covered that a little bit. Go listen to the teaching, whose eyes are you right in? We do cover this verse in that teaching, I'm sure. All right? So doing what is right in their own eyes. So now he's saying, don't do this. And he gives a reason. He says, because you have not yet entered the rest and the inheritance which Yahweh Elohim is giving you. He's saying, you're not going to be qualified to do what's right in your understanding until you've arrived. Then you'll be qualified to make decisions, correct decisions, in a right vertical manner, etc. Because even Yeshua, who's arrived more than anybody, says, I only do what my father says to do. I only say what my father wants me to say. But he says, don't do what you're doing, as is here, everybody doing what's right in their eyes, because you have not yet entered. Anybody entered yet? 
I know a lot of people out of the charismania and all the other parts of Christianity all think they've, we're arrived. We're, we're the kingdom now. We're a kingdom of priests. No, you're delusional and in big trouble. You're in a lot of danger. You've not yet arrived. Okay? He says, but you shall pass over the Jordan and shall dwell in the land which Yahweh your is giving you to inherit. And then he's going to give you rest from your enemies. In other words, he's going to set you in a place where you can learn and be unmolested and undisturbed, not harassed. Of course, we're in the dispersion right now, so everything we get harassed for. But they were going to go into the land where they would be undisturbed if they would listen and do what they were supposed to do. He says, let's see, 1225. He says, um, what's this linking up with what verse? Verse 9. Hold on, I just want to see why I put this in here. Okay, so in 12.25, he says, Do not eat it that it might be well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh. So it might be well with you and your children. So you want it to be well with you and your children, you have to do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh, not right in your own eyes. Chapter 13 and verse 18, same thing. When you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim to guard all his commands, which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim. There's a theme here. The theme is you have to do what's right in his eyes, and the other part of it is you don't know what that is, but Moses does. So listen to Moshe. Because Moshe is telling you what's right in Yahweh's eyes. Well, he knows my heart. Don't do that. Because you're already, if you're doing that, you're already in trouble. That's, that's your justification for doing something you shouldn't. Don't do that. Don't spin things. You're going to have to make some really tough choices in life. You know, I counseled somebody today, and that was the same sort of thing. But this was a young man. But you know what? Don't care how old you are. At some point, if you're going to grow up and be mature, you have to realize you are responsible in a mature way. That's what maturing means, to make choices. And then live with, this is the hard part, the consequences. And some of the choices are tough because you know if you make that choice, there'll be adverse consequences that you really don't want, but it's still the right choice. You want to be, you want to be a really grown-up person? Think things through, get counsel, make the tough choice, own the consequences. Okay? And I told that young man, I said, you can do this. This is the beginning of your life. You're only in your early 20s. Guess what? You're going to walk this out. This is a great starting point for you. You've got a tough choice to make. It's going to have some consequences. It's the right thing to do. Life does not, see, this is for all of you. Think about how many things you struggle with and then wonder, am I struggling only for one reason? Am I struggling? Is it because of the consequences I'm trying still to figure out how to avoid? See, a lot of you have not made choices you need to make because you're not ready to own the consequences. Okay? So you won't make the choice. So you're avoiding it and you're torturing yourself because you're still convinced that you can avoid the consequences if you make the right choice. Because making the right choice, when it's not the choice other people would have you make, brings consequences that are adverse to your life. You don't want to have people, they're going to be mad at you, they're not going to talk to you, they're going to do this, they're going to call you names, whatever they're going to do. And so you sit back and you don't do anything. But you know you need to make a choice. And then sometimes Abba will put you in a place where you have no choice. You have to make a choice. And to do the right thing may bring bad consequences. To do the wrong thing will also bring consequences, but different consequences. So now you've got to figure out what the right thing is. And then once you know, go forward. Accept the consequences. All right. This is, where the, this is what Israel struggled with all the time. Let's see. Where are we going now? Um, all right. We already looked at verse 13 of chapter 12. You can't do offerings anywhere you want. All right. Verse 15. This is proof that you can eat whatever you want. 
No, people don't. This verse always comes up, so I'm preemptively striking. I'm sure everybody all over the chat has been wondering, what's about this gazelle and the deer and the clean and the unclean? All right. Let's first look at chapter 15 and verse 22. Because 15, is that where I want to go? No. It's the, where is it? 14.5, because 14 is going to be dealing with kashrut. Okay, 14.5. So in the clean animals that you can eat, the deer and the gazelle are listed. So we're not talking about, as people might guess, the unclean and the clean, like the deer and the gazelle. That's not what he's saying there. So what is he saying there? 12, verse, chapter 12 and verse um, 16, all right? Or even 15, excuse me. Only whatever your being desires, you shall slaughter and eat according to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim, which he has given you. Within all your gates, the unclean and the clean do eat of it. The unclean and the clean eat of it. He didn't say eat of the unclean and the clean. He says the unclean and clean are eating. So it's talking about a status. See, it's so funny. You guys, maybe not anymore, but once upon a time, you were status obsessed. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm like these are all statuses that are so important. Well, there are a few statuses in scripture. One status is called tame, that's unclean. Another one's called tahor, which is called clean. Another one's called covenanted. These are statuses. And by the way, they're not permanent. If you're tame, you can become tahor. If you're tahor, you can become tame. If you're covenanted, you can become uncovenanted. So he's saying is, when you do these things, which by the way, in everybody's Bible is Deuteronomy after Leviticus, where we were told that certain things only those who are tahor can eat, and other things, those that are ta tame, you know, because tame can't eat it, right? There's things that are, you have to be in a certain condition to partake of it when doing offerings and things. He's saying when you do this, this celebration here, Whatever your status of Tame or Tahor is, doesn't matter. You can still eat of it. Okay? This is important. The clean and unclean is talking about the people doing the eating, not what they are eating. Because it says, like the gazelle and the deer, they're both clean. As far as food, they're both food. Okay, and we see this repeated in a couple of places in 12.22 and 14.5 is where they explain what the, that the deer and the gazelle listed as clean, and then 15.22 as well. All right, so it's a couple of places saying that these are things that are going on. He says, and by the way, when you go to do this, it doesn't matter if you're Tamea Tohor, you can eat it. That's all it's saying is that this one everybody can eat, whether they're clean or unclean ritually, because Tamea Tohor is a ritual cleanliness versus a ritual unclean. So if you're Tame, you cannot go into the Mishkan, into the tabernacle. You have to go through a process to become Tahor, then you can go in. Okay? Now, so hopefully that makes sense, because I know a lot of people go, well, what about this? Well, because you got to understand it's talking about people here, not animals. All right? It's nothing to do with what they're eating. Verse 16, don't eat the blood. It's also chapter 12, verse 23 and 24, and 15, 23. So don't eat the blood, okay? Now, we'll actually skip that for today in terms of getting way into the details of it. That's an important thing, is don't eat the blood. Now, it says to pour it on the ground. So we're talking about fresh blood, slaughtered animal, and pouring out their blood, okay? And so we'll talk about that more in a Kashru teaching because I want to speed this up just a little bit because we're still in chapter 12. We've got to go all the way to 16. Although we're not going to spend much time in 14 because we all have gone through the Kashru to animals before. All right. At least not that part of the chapter. All right. Let's see. 17 and 18 of this verse. So chapter 12. You are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine, etc. Um... But eat them in the place where Yahweh Elohim, uh, uh, let's see, where Yahweh your Elohim, uh, eat them before Yahweh Elohim in the place which Yahweh Elohim chooses, you and your son and your daughter, etc., and the Levite is in your gates, and you shall rejoice. Okay, so this is talking about celebration, and in doing the celebration, you are to go to the place where Yahweh has said. So what, what does this look like today? Well, first of all, it says, you are not allowed to eat 
within your gates your tithe and your grain. You don't get to eat your tithe and your grain in your dwelling place. Okay, the tithe goes to the Levite. And we talk about in chapter 14, we'll talk about the second tithe. That's when you get to eat. But notice it says here very clearly, you are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your offering, etc., but eat them before Yahweh, your Elohim, in the place he chooses, you and your son and daughter, your male servant, etc. So now they're saying you have to bring these things to the place. And if you know Leviticus, you know some things you bring and you eat with the priests. And there's, a way, there's certain things you get to eat, certain things that are for them, etc., Remember, this is including not just your tithe, but it also talks about all these other offerings as well. Or any of your vow offerings, excuse me, your offerings which you vow and your voluntary offerings and your contributions. So they're not for you to be using in your house. You're supposed to bring them to where they're supposed to go. Nowadays, you can mail them because we can change that out. Okay, exchange it as it says here in chapter 14 for silver. We'll get there in a minute. All right. Now, as far as the place where he places his name, that's a really interesting thing. Once upon a time, and I may still be there to some degree, I believe this only meant Jerusalem. Because once you've named that his place, that's it. But then from a functional point of view, there are places where his authority is. So that's where we do certain things that don't get into offerings and things that only must be done in the temple in a place but we still gather in local assemblies, and hopefully that's a place his name has been placed, and you can bring these things there, provided it really is a place his name has been placed. I mean, every assembly thinks that's what they are. I mean, you watch anybody's broadcast, that's what they say. So the discernment is left to you. Okay, the discernment is left to you. All right. Verse 19. So he just said that, you can bring these and eat them, etc. Then he says, guard yourself, verse 19, that you do not forsake the Levite. So what he's saying is you could be doing all these things and getting all excited and having all this fun and enjoying and celebrating and have the abundance, and you could forget that you're supposed to be giving what you're supposed to give to that Levite. But notice it doesn't say guard and do here. It says guard yourself because the person that's going to be the problem is going to be you. You are going to not want to give it to them. You're going to want to use it for yourself. You're going to forget. You're going to get distracted because you're not thinking that the priority is to make sure that Levite is taken care of. Okay? So, so you need to guard yourself that you do not forsake the Levite. Why? He says because the Levite has no inheritance. So, but Rabbi, you're not a Levite, and we don't have Levites anymore. True. Do we only do things in the Peshat? Or do we see that there are teachings for a structural understanding of the one without inheritance needs to be protected and not forsaken. Guard that you don't forsake the one without inheritance. The one standing before the Almighty to appeal for you on your behalf and who brings the instruction and the teaching and the right rulings, etc. All right? All right. Continuing here. Um, verse... 21. So 12, 21. When the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you shall slaughter from your herd and from your flock which Yahweh has given you as I command you, and you shall eat within your gates as much as your being desires. So what is it talking about? So in verse 20 it says, when Yahweh enlarges your border and he's promised you and you say, let me eat meat. Because you long to eat meat and, you're, and you uh, eat as much as meat as your being desires. So what he's saying is, you can slaughter animals to eat, but if you really wa wa follow the whole thing through, he says, but not what was supposed to be given as the offering and the tithe. He's saying you can take from your flock and from your herd, and you can kill them and eat them and celebrate because the place is far. He says, but that doesn't change the tithe being the tithe. All right? Let's see. In verse 20... Oh, I want to do that. Okay, verse 26 connects us together. Only to set apart gifts which you have, your vowed offerings you are able to take up and go to the place where you are. So he's saying, look, the place is really far, fine. Take some of your flock, slaughter them, have the food for yourself, but the stuff that you're supposed to bring, you protect that. Because you still got to show up and say, I have not messed with this. I've not tampered with it. I've not done anything to it. All right. Let's see. 
verse 25. Um, we already covered that. Well, here's the thing. He says, when it talks about do not eat the uh, blood poured on the earth, do not eat it that it might be well with you and your children after you when you do what is right. Just always remember that it's going to be well with you and your children when you do what is right. Okay? Now, we're in the dispersion. That doesn't mean like it's an, like an instantaneous formula. You do what's right, you and your children are going to be fine. Yes, but not literally in the now. More ultimately in the picture. Now, when they lived in the land, it would have been right in the now. They don't li- we don't live in the land now. We're in the punishment, right? We're in the galut. We're in the uh, dispersion, the exile. All right, let's see. 1228 kind of covers that. Guard and obey all these words which I command you, that it might be well with you and your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim. Seems straightforward. Some of you are thinking, they never told me that in Sunday. How could they? They did away with all this stuff. All this stuff that har Do you hear anything about this being the greatest thing ever invented when you hear this stuff? It sounds like Torah is the greatest thing ever given. It blesses you. It keeps you safe. It's going to be good for you and your children and all these other things are going to be wonderful. Why wouldn't you want this? Yet we're told in Christianity this is awful. It was a burden. It was a punishment giving you laws to do. I want to give you a thought. Okay, a couple of thoughts. This came up in a conversation I had earlier with somebody. And so, you know how in Christianity they have the idea of being saved. You know, I think that that's a problem because it's a status and we don't really have saved is not a status, okay? Salvation or deliverance is something that, you know, you get delivered out of something, right? They got delivered out of Egypt. So when they want to talk about the works and salvation, well, guess what? They were delivered out of Egypt, then they were given the law. So the free gift of deliverance, but why were they delivered? So they could be given the law. They were given the law after deliverance, because otherwise, how could they take the law and do anything with it if they weren't delivered first? And then they were told that the covenanting brings them into the land, the kingdom, the forever. You're in a mess. You're in the world. I pull you out. We can look at you know, Exodus you know, 6, 6 and talk about the four cups and that thing. Okay, the idea of delivered and brought out and redeemed. But then, because the reason, that I, the reason he pulled you out was so he can give you the Torah. And then his expectation is that in covenanting with him and obeying and submitting to his words, then you would receive the reward of the forever kingdom. That's exactly what I've taught you guys all along. I just like the way that it kind of came about in this conversation today. Okay? So their deliverance out of Egypt was completely not about them. It was something that Yahweh wanted to do. He said they didn't deserve it or earn it. They were slaves doing whatever they were doing. So free gift. Their works had nothing to do with it. However, there was an expectation You know, some people like to spin this in the Messianic saying, oh, well, we don't have to keep the law, but we get to. No, no. If you're going to covenant, you have to keep the law. If you want the reward, you have to keep the law. But you were redeemed so that you could. You couldn't do it in bondage. In bondage to the world, you couldn't do all of these things. So he brought you out, saved you, so he could give you the Torah. He didn't save you from it. Saved you from the world so you can give it to you and then see what you do with it. So I think that's very important. And then I, another concept came up that I really like, and it was the idea of we, we're not here to evangelize. We're not here. Things I've said, right? We're not here to try to proselytize or whatever it is. You know what our job is? Think of it this way. If Yahweh was here right now, really wouldn't be any free will. He'd be so impressive, everybody would just bow and freak out and do whatever he said. Would totally take away all free will. 
So he hides himself so that we have free will. And then he gives a people a responsibility to manifest him in the world. And we manifest him through Torah observance. And then the world gets to see him through those things that we do that are his. All right? So our job is to manifest Elohim in the world. But we manifest him not through big showy things. We manifest him when we choose not to eat pork. We manifest him when we choose not to work on Shabbos. We manifest him when we choose any number of simple acts. When we wear our seats, you know, when we choose to avoid a conversation that we shouldn't be in, when people are maybe tearing down other people or some other things going on, some Lashon Hara. I mean, these are all ways of manifesting him in the world. And so that's really what this is talking about. He says, look, I want you to guard and obey all these things that it might be well with you and your children after you because this is what is good and right in the eyes of Yahweh. And we demonstrate that through our manifestation through obedience. Okay? Does that, how's, does that work for you? I like those distinctions that came out today. And it actually fits into the Torah portion, so I thought it would work out good here. All right, let's see. Next page. Verses 29 and 30. Let's see. When, when Yahweh Elohim does cut off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in the land, guard yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them. Okay, so what is this talking about. Look at the end of it says, how did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so too. This is the do not do as they do, right? So what does that look like today? Be careful when you go out there on the internet and you go to visit other congregations, whatever you're doing, and saying, oh, that looked great. I enjoyed that. Maybe that's what we need to be doing. Because maybe yes, maybe no. But you got to be worried about this verse before you start incorporating anything in what you do. Because this verse says, guard yourself that you're not ensnared and follow others. So be careful who you're following. Make sure it's an anointed, appointed, not just anointed by anybody, but anointed of Yah, because uh, Hasatan's got his own anointeds. And they look just as much and just as impressive as a Yahweh anointed. That's why it's some hard, sometimes it's a little confusing hard out there for us. He says, they are to be destroyed before you that you do not inquire about their mighty one saying, how did this nation serve? Well, what do you guys do on Shabbat? And how do you guys do this? And how do you guys do that? And then you come to me all confused. Well, shouldn't we be doing this, Rabbi? Shouldn't we be doing that, Rabbi? If I thought you should, I would have told you. <laughs> Listen, I didn't just waste my breath for 600 plus teachings. Those are the things I think you need to know and do. And I will continue to give you that. You can certainly ask the questions, but just be careful. Don't just start following. Be aware that there could be an ensnaring that may happen. Okay? Anytime you're wondering how other people are doing whatever they're doing, that doesn't mean it's a wrong thing to do. Just realize it's potentially dangerous. Again, you're not going to learn anything if you never ask and don't have a curiosity, but just realize it could get you in trouble if you're not guarding yourself. So when it says guarding yourself, what is that always talking about? What's the fear that you're guarding against? An emotional yearning for something you shouldn't want or shouldn't have or shouldn't do. Guard yourself emotionally. I like that. That could be really good or really dangerous. Because if whatever it is you like is appropriate, that's good. If it's not, that's dangerous. So you have to guard yourself. So when it says guard yourself, that means guard the me, me, I like, I want, I prefer, I don't like, I don't prefer, whatever. Just the me stuff. Guard against that. Don't do and not do because you want it. Don't guard and not do because he said so. That'll keep you out of the confusion of the me, me, me. Okay? All right, let's continue here. We get to chapter 13. 
Beware false prophets. This is the chapter for that teaching. All right. So in verse, verses 1 through 11, I'm just going to paraphrase the whole thing. So what you have going on here is what? It says, look, there can arise among you somebody who's a dreamer of dreams or claims to be a prophet or does a sign or a wonder, etc. something impressive. And you're like, wow. Do you know, it's been a little while, but it used to be every week somebody sent me an email from somebody in Christianity that, you know, had a vision, had a word, and they're all impressed with it and everything. It's like, look, I'm sorry, I'm not learning or receiving anything from somebody who's not covenanted. And if they're Christian, then they're in a different covenant. Okay? And so, I don't care how impressed you are, it's breaking Deuteronomy 13. Because their impressiveness is going to lead you to think that they're coming from a right place, which means you may be led away from Torah observance, covenant, and Yahweh. And this is really the problem. So he says, look, be careful when there arises such a person. Because when their sign or wonder comes true, this is important. See, we have, we have in chapter 18 and verse 22, well, verse 21, it says, when you say in your heart, how do we know that the word of Yahweh has not spoken? He's talking about a false prophet. Okay, verse 20 actually says, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I did not command or speak, that one shall die. He says, well, how do we know who he is? He says, when they speak it and it doesn't happen. Well, in 13, we're talking about when they speak it and it does happen. So now you're really kind of messed up because, wait a minute, if they speak it and it doesn't happen, okay, that's easy. What if they speak it and it does happen? So now we got to look to the underlying intention or purpose of what's happening. Signs and wonders are not just there so you go, wow. It's not fireworks. Fireworks is just there you go, wow, Okay. Signs and wonders are to get you to go, wow, they must have some connection vertically to something I need to get connected to. So it's much more than just, wow, okay? It can draw you towards whatever made the wow. So the way he words it here in verse 2, he says, the sign of wonder comes true, which, which, he, has not, uh, which he has spoken to you, saying, let... Let us go to after other mighty ones which you have not known and serve them. Now, he's not going to literally say, that'd be so stupid. False prophet goes, let's go serve other gods. <laughs> no, what he's going to do is say, let's serve Yahweh. Remember, that was a problem in the other chapters. This way. The way the rest, other religions or other groups of people serve him. Now, he says, which you have not known. He's saying, you have a relationship with me. That's the knowing. And they're going to draw you off to a relationship that is not me. You should know better. You know me, you know that's not me. That's part of how we know a false prophet. They're teaching a Yahweh you had not known. Of course, a true prophet, when you're coming out of the ignorance of, of Babylon, is also going to teach you about a Yahweh you had not known, but one you need to know. But look at how he explains it in verse 3. He says, Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your Elohim is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and all your being. Walk after Yahweh your Elohim and fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice, serve him, cling to him. That prophet is to be put to death because he spoke apostasy against Yahweh. Now look, we are not in the land. We do not have the judges and the judicial system necessary to kill a prophet. Even if you wanted to, which you probably shouldn't want to kill anybody, right? Okay? But there was a responsibility in the land to do this. So what do we do today? Well, I would say at the very least, stop listening to them. Stop watching their videos. Stop supporting their ministries. Stop listening. And by the way, there's plenty of them out there that meet either 13 or 18. When we're in chapter 13 or chapter 18, it doesn't matter. There's ones out there that say stuff and it doesn't happen. 
Like every year they say stuff that doesn't happen. And every year more people send the money and keep listening to them. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, but I like him. There's not a single verse anywhere that says that liking the teacher, the prophet, is relevant. There is not a single verse that liking somebody changes the law. He says if that person matches the criteria false, either leading you into something that's against Torah and Yahweh or something that is you know, stated by them and doesn't happen, so it's not even like, like they said it didn't happen, done. But yet you guys come to me and you're still listening to these people. And you just need to understand, that's not what he's talking about. He's not saying you should just ignore all of this and just keep listening to those people. You can't cut them off, at least you can cut them off in your own life. In other words, cut off access that you're giving them. If these people are naming dates, which they've all done, I can name you a dozen people that you all know that name dates. And those dates have all passed many times over. Like, they've done this more than once. They're like serial date namers. Okay? Then they should be finished. And if they're listening now, I don't care if you're mad at me. Knock it off. Stop naming dates. Stop fear-mongering the people and just trying to sell your books and your tapes thinking, there's still a guy out there thinks he's coming this year because it's a Shemitah year. Well, that means he's going to be here in less than 60 days. I don't think so. Okay? Ignoring all the other things that have to happen first. But yet, people are listening to these guys. Look, are you obeying or you're not obeying the commandments? Deuteronomy 13 is for them in the land, yes, but what part is it for you? Everything in this book is written to other people, but for you. Two, meaning it was written to people at this time going into the land. As a matter of fact, it wasn't written to them, it was spoken to them, and then was written down. Moses is speaking to a people who are risking this can happen in their lives when they go in the land. But it's for you on some level. Paul tells us that. Everything that's written is for you. It's for everybody. In every generation on some level. So what are you going to get out of this false prophets thing? I know a lot of you watch my teaching and you think it's all exciting because I name who I think, you know, how that might play out. Well, yeah, but what about the rest of it? What about all the other prophets out there? Not like the anti-Messiah, the ultimate false, but all these other ones out there that are leading you into confusion and away from covenant properly. Because they're going to teach you that you can covenant doing less, doing different, and that you're still in covenant when you're not. And there's nothing worse than convincing you you're in when you're out. Or you're okay when you're not. All right. Let's continue here. So what does it say? It says, number one, in verse two it says, which, these are which you have not known. She had not a relationship with. In verse three it says, do not listen to the words of that prophet. So that backs up what I'm saying, right? Do not listen to the words of that prophet. It says it right there in verse three. First, <laughs> the beginning of the verse, right? Do not listen to the words. But you watch their videos and get their CDs and listen to them on their broadcasts and podcasts. You're listening to the words. Question, is anyone or anything enticing you away from Yahweh or Torah? That's a false prophet in your life. Is, is there anything or anyone that's enticing you away? Okay, this is what it's dealing with in the first 11 verses. It's also talking about, look, I don't care if it's... Oh, but I like that teacher. I like that teacher. He says, look, even if it's your brother or your mother or your father, he says, you're going to kill him. You've got to purge that evil out of your midst. End of verse 5. Purge the evil. It says, when your brother or the son of your mother does these things. Verse 9, you certainly put him to death. Wow. And you're being protective of somebody you don't even know who's like on a ministry on the internet that you've never met? Or maybe you have met him, so what? It says, even if your brother, the son of your mother, <laughs> Okay? So now we're not just saying your brother by any other level of birth. Like, this is the son of your mother. 
like you are from the same mom. Even that person will be put to death. It's pretty strong. Along those lines, we've got verses 15 through 17, which gives us the explanation of what it means to be under the ban. Okay, so verse 15 says, You shall certainly smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, putting it under the ban. And all that is in it, its livestock with the edge of the sword, and gather all its plunder into the middle of the street, and completely burn with fire the city and its plunder before Yahweh Elohim, and it shall be a heap forever, never to be built again. And none of that which is put under the ban is to cling to your hand, so that Yahweh turns from the fierceness of his displeasure, and show, shall show you compassion, love, love you, and increase you as you are to your fathers." when you obey. All right, so what is under the ban? To completely destroy. You are to keep none of it and say, well, I'll destroy all of it, but this little thing over here, I kind of like it, I'm gonna keep that. Okay, when Yahweh says to destroy it, that's it, okay? Because that comes up a lot, what does under the ban mean? Um, I think I'll skip that. Let's go to 14.23. So we're jumping now past all of the kashrut issues, and we're going to go to 14.23 through 27. This is the verses that deal with the second tithe, the second tithe. So hopefully at this point from look, reading Leviticus and Numbers, etc., we know that the first tithe or the tithe that's talked about up until this point in any clarity belonged to who? The Levite, okay? Were you allowed to eat it? No. Were you allowed to keep it for yourself? No. It belonged to them. Well, listen here in verse 23. And you shall eat before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he chooses to make his name dwell, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first things of your herds and your sheep, so you learn to fear Yahweh your Elohim always. So you're going to eat this one, whatever this is. And when the way is too long for you, that you're unable to bring the tithe, or when the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you, when Yahweh your Elohim is blessing you, then you shall give it in silver, and shall take the silver in your hand and go to the place which Yahweh your Elohim chooses. And you shall use the silver for whatever your being desires, for cattle or sheep, for wine and straw and drink, for whatever your being desires, and you shall eat there before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. Okay, so this is talking about money or silver. And it's, and by the way, for those who want to go very literal, and our Jewish brothers do that a lot, and that's not wrong necessarily, but if this is to be taken literally, you can only take your tithe and turn it into silver. You can't turn it into U.S. dollars. You can't turn it into other currencies or gold even. It says you're going to do it in silver. Clearly, it's making a point of changing it into an exchangeable currency. Okay, it doesn't have to necessarily be silver. Okay. So... And it says, you're going to use it. Now, what's the, when it says in verse 26, and you shall use the silver for whatever your being desires, what did we turn into silver? The tithe. So this is a tithe that you're going to enjoy and spend on whatever you want. Hmm. And that includes wine and strong drink. Boy, did we have a battle with some Adventists over this about 20 years ago. I had a lady running around telling everybody that you know, Yeshua turned the wine into good grape juice, the grapes into great, you know, the, the water into good grape juice. That's what it was. The, that wine is spoiled grapes. Yes, they're fermented. So in the Hebrew here, it says, shamar. What does shamar mean? Shamar is the guard. Shamar is the guard. It says, um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong Hebrew on the wrong verse. We're not to chapter 16. It says here, this says, uviayin uve shechar. Okay, so now we have to understand what is yayin and what is shechar. So yayin is wine. Every Jew knows it's wine. Everywhere it's translated in Hebrew, it's wine. Into the English, right? It's wine. We know what wine is. It's fermented grapes. Okay, so it's wine. Shechar, what does shechar mean? Shechar is a strong, intoxicating, and f fermented drink. So we're talking about like liquor, like, like someone has a, like, a, like we more like whiskey or something, right? A fermented alcohol drink. So it's strong, highly intoxicating is the way the Hebrew comes out. So because people like to think, oh no, no, you can't, 
He can't possibly be telling us that we can drink. He didn't say to get drunk. Matter of fact, he tells you not to get drunk. But he says here, you can take that silver and you can buy yayin and shachar. Now, if you happen to be going to a feast somewhere, this is important because we have people that totally didn't listen, and the rules of that place is no yayin, no shachar, then you cannot do it because that's the rules of the place. And we had people that snuck it in different containers and got drunk anyway and embarrassed me and because they just, people just don't listen. What you need to understand is that is the thing that makes Yahweh more disappointed than the fact that you were drinking. Is your rebellious, self-centered, self-whatever, self-anointed, I don't know, self-sovereign thing to just do what you want to do regardless of the rules. And this has happened on several properties that we went to, and, and I found out that people were drinking. And I was just like, and then they got mad at me when I busted them. You're getting mad at me for. I'm furious with you. You're going to get me in trouble with the property. You didn't listen to what I said when I said no. Well, the, but the scripture says, the scripture doesn't say you have to have it. Then I would let you. Okay? It says you could have it, except on this property, they don't let us. So bear that in mind, please. Always make sure that it's allowable where you go. All right. That deals with the wine and strong drink thing. Because I actually had to call this lady out because she was just driving everybody nuts about the whole wine and the stuff. And I said, look, I'm going to read this to you from Deuteronomy. Because she was trying to only go to the, the wedding where Yeshua turned the water into wine. I said, well, this is Yahweh speaking through Moses. Thus said Yahweh, you can buy strong drink. And there is no confusion of what kind of drink this is. The yayin, you want to make an argument that it's just grape juice. Well, listen, they didn't have refrigeration or anything. That grape juice is going to become wine or vinegar one way or the other. Okay? There was nothing going to stop that. Unless you drank it quick enough, it was going to turn into one or the other. All right. Now, verse 28 and 29 is now talking about a different tithe. First one we know the, the Levites got. This one you were going to eat and buy whatever you wanted with. At the end of every third year, you bring out all the tithe of your increase in that year and store it up in your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates shall come and eat and be satisfied so that Yahweh, your Elohim, does bless you in the work of, their, of your hands, which you do. Now, that, again, is a verse that doesn't give us any more information than that. But what we see play out, and we also can see this in one of the apocryphal books, Okay, that it's actually mentioned as a third tithe. And that tithe was used for the benevolence of the widows, orphans, and the poor. Okay? And it was done in the third year. So every third year, so year three and year six of the seven-year cycle. And that's how we teach it to be done here. So that's where our three tithes come from, this chapter here. All right, chapter 15. We're doing good. At 8.42. Okay. I only have a couple more things here. All right, chapter 15 and verse 4 and 5. Okay, so we have some interesting comparisons here that are going on in 15 and verses 4 and 5 and then verse 11. So in 4 and 5 it says, Only there should be no poor among you, for Yahweh does greatly bless you in the land which Yahweh is giving you to possess an inheritance. Only if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh Elohim to guard and do all these things. So again, he says he's giving you to possess his inheritance only if you obey. Remember, he brought them out of Egypt freely, gave them the Torah. He says, but you only get this if you obey. Guess what happened when they didn't obey? He threw them out. Anybody have children like that? They're not obeying. They need to get thrown out. You get to live in this land when you obey. You don't obey, there's a door. Okay? Now, some of you are very reluctant to do that. But they'll never survive. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. They're not going to survive with you coddling them either. They'll never be able to survive. Now, so we just read that there should be no poor among you. There should be no poor among you. But wait a minute. We get down to verse, what did I say we're going to go to? Verse 11. 
Because the poor ones does not cease from the land. Okay. So let's, let's start in verse 7. When there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, within any of your gates in the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you, do not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. For you certainly shall open your hand to him, certainly lend him enough for his need and whatever he needs. Be on guard, lest there be a thought of Belial in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye is evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he shall cry out to Yahweh against you, and it shall be sin in you. You shall certainly give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him, because for this reason Yahweh Elohim does bless you in all your works, and in all which you put your hand to. So he's saying, look, there should not be poor among you. However, there will be because you need to learn how to be generous and how to care for your brother and appreciate that I gave you the wealth to establish my covenant and to bless others. So it's not a contradiction. He's just saying is, look, I know you would think because I'm giving you everything that there shouldn't be any poor. And really there shouldn't, but you guys are going to mess up and people are going to do dumb things and they're going to be poor. And it says in other verses, the poor are with us always. Why? So that we can learn to care for those with less. Now, the Shemitah years was being talked about here, where the person might say, well, you know, it, it, you know, if it was year two, I would maybe lend to them, and they can kind of pay it off over five more years. But now it's year six, and next year they're going to be released, and that's not enough time, and, you know. He's saying, it doesn't matter where we are in the cycle. Help them. It doesn't matter. They need help now, help them. And yes, you're going to release them next year anyway. Because these are geniuses that are doing the math. Well, it's, let's see, it's year five, and I only get two years, and probably for what I'm doing, I probably need four years, where I'm not doing it. He's saying, I'll just give you more. Don't worry about it. Do what you're supposed to do, and you will always have more than enough. Do what you're supposed to do, and you will always have more than enough. Okay? All right, let's see. Verse, uh, now we're up to chapter 16. See, I told you we're going to be quick here. So guard the month of Aviv and perform the Passover in it. Okay, so guard the month of Aviv. This does not say go look for green barley leaves and all that other nonsense. Nowhere does it actually say that. There's not a single verse that tells people to go and find barley and see the status of the barley. If you had a little bit of Jewish in you, like background and training, etc., you would know that this is the way that the Jews would say, in the spring, you're going to keep the Passover. In the month when it's spring. The, when the beginning of spring. All right. So, he says, guard that because that's when you have to keep the Passover. So we have that. So, in the Hebrew there it says, Shamor et Chodesh. Ha'aviv. So this is the Chodesh of the Aviv. Chodesh meaning the new month or the month of the Aviv. Okay. Now we know in Exodus that in the plague of the hail, which is the first place you see the word Aviv mentioned, that the barley was Aviv. Okay, so the barley was Aviv. So that's the status that it was in terms of its growing. But we also know in the next plague that the locusts ate everything that the hail didn't destroy. So probably when they left Egypt, it seems to me there wasn't anything that was actually Aviv. <laughs> so nobody would have been looking for anything Aviv at that point. And by the way, we don't know how much time there was between plagues. So apparently, at least by the time we got to the hail, there was Aviv. There's several more plagues before they leave. How much time is that? See, when we look at the instruction to count the Omer, right, to lead to Shavuot, it, it's only required that the barley be in that state where it can be waved. It could have been in that state longer, not shorter. In other words, it has to be in that state, but it could have been for a while, and you cut the sheaves and you store them and you hold them to do the offering. So the important thing was that they were already in that state, okay? Now, we do have more interesting things here in chapter 16 about timing and calendars and stuff, so we can have a little bit of fun. In verse 13, all calendar people, attention. Do I have your attention? 
you need to make sure your calendar fits verse 13. Okay? It says, perform the Feast of Booths for seven days after you've done this. In other words, whatever your timing is of your calendar, it has to be after the ingathering from your threshing floor and the wine press. And I've heard almost, no, I'm the only one I've ever heard mention this. <laughs> and I've been studying this out a long time. Nobody ever mentions verse 13 in figuring out their calendars. This is one of the reasons why at the moment we're using Hillel's and we're not arguing about anything. Okay? But all you geniuses that think you've solved the riddle of the puzzle of the whole thing with the calendar, your calendar better make sure this verse works because that's one of the verses you need if you're figuring out your own calendar. I don't recommend that you do that anyway. I'm just saying, okay? Because it gives you a timing mechanism for Sukkot. All right. Now, lastly, we've got two verses here at the end dealing with the Shalosh Regalim, the three Hagim, the pilgrimage feasts, okay? These are in verse 16. Three times a year all your males appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he chooses at Chag HaMatzot, Chag HaShavuot, and Chag HaSukot. Okay? So that's literally what the, so the, the Hebrew says, let's see, it says exactly what I said, Chag HaMatzot, Uva Chag HaShavuot, Uva Chag HaSukot. So three times a year, you're going to appear. All the men are going to appear. Now listen, when they come for the three pilgrimage feasts, by the way, we're one of the few ministries that does all three as pilgrimage feasts. I've been in ministries that did Sukkot. Some of you have visited ministries that did Sukkot. We do all three. And people come for all three. He says, and none should appear before Yahweh empty-handed, but each one with a gift in his hand according to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim which he has given you. So this is one of the only places where he commands an offering. Offerings are voluntary. You give something from, but he says you need to bring one three times a year. You can do other things more often, whatever you want, but three times a year don't come empty-handed. So my recommendation to all of you is prepare before you get here so if you know that the next one's coming, Sukkot, right? We just finished Shavuot, now we're Sukkot. You should be putting aside and, and, and laying aside whatever it is that you're planning to give as your offering. Maybe you keep adding a little bit to it through, through the weeks leading up so that when you get here, you're not thinking, well, I really wanted to make an offering of blah, 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 but I'm broke. Well, because you didn't plan for it. You should be putting money aside for those three offerings. Because you're mandated to bring something, okay? It doesn't say every Shabbat. It doesn't say every holy day. It says these three times, don't come empty-handed. Bring something. It says with your gift in your hand. All right, and with that, I'm done. That's not even 9 o'clock yet. That was not bad. All right, I hope that was a blessing. Let's see if we can get a couple of quick questions in. Okay, we can see if we can get a couple of quick questions in. All right, Steve, you got a couple? All right, I got two real quick ones. In 1126, um, yes, it, the, the first word there was C, so I looked it up. It says, uh, de, discern or deduce after reflection from information to understand. So maybe we should, when we're trying to see, we need to not see with our own understanding, but see with the Father's perspective, so that way we see it correctly. Very well said. Appreciate that. Okay, and then on three, uh, 13, three, it's, uh, I believe it says, Abba tests us uh, to test our resolve to seek after him, but maybe he uses even what's in our heart's desire to see if we'll turn to what we desire and leaving him to the side. So maybe we should think about that as another as so. well. Very good. Very good. Janet? Sorry. Rabbi, I have a couple of questions. So Well, let's uh, start with one. Okay. Because it's almost 9 o'clock. One. Uh, so where is my first one? I guess this is more relevant. Um, 12.30, I think it was... 
what you were talking about uh, guard yourself, that you're not a snare to follow them. Yep. And I mean, I think you were talking about following like false teachers or people who are not uh, aligned with what, you know, Torah. So can you get snare by hanging out with people who are following other teachers as a secondary kind of uh, way or? All right, so what actually is ensnare? Well, you hold the mic. So what's actually ensnaring you? En ensnare, for me, to me, what it means is uh, no, what's, misguided. I know, but what's causing the ensnaring? A emotional response to liking something. Okay, so you're ensnared by your emotions. And actually, we read that in the Birch Shah. So when you're hanging out with people who are following other teachers, not necessarily a problem, provided you're not feeding into an emotional connection now because you're liking, oh, that's impressive. Maybe I need to check that teacher out. Then that could lead you to a teacher, depending on who the teacher is. Maybe it's a good teacher. But you got to be careful and know what that teacher is teaching and where they're going because it's your emotions that will ensnare you. So it's where you start going, I like that. I want that. I desire that. And the that that you're liking and desiring and wanting is not you know, appropriate. It's not of yeah, that will ensnare you. Okay? So the main thing is that we are being ensnared by our feelings for something. Okay? By the way, it works in the reverse, too. You start having all kinds of negative feelings and all kinds of emotional problems with your teacher, and that'll cause you to leave when you shouldn't, but you're having an emotional response. Oh, but I don't like him. You know what? Most of the people that don't like me, it's because they don't like something that I showed them in them, and they don't want to deal with it. I'm just, that's just the truth. Well, I don't like the way you talk to me. No, you don't like that I actually was one of the only people in your life that ever told you what you needed to hear. And so you don't want to handle that. So you want to go someplace where they won't ever say anything like that. Okay, Eduardo. Rabbi, I need to be set straight on the last portion of uh, Deborahim 1421. Um, many Yehudim do not um, eat meet with dairy because of this. Should I not be eating cheeseburgers? All right. That was the one I purposely skipped. <laughs> it's like, as I, as I finished under the ban and went to second tithe, they, remember I said that we're going to not do this kashrut thing? That was the one I skipped. All right. So 1421, three places it says, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. This is one of the places that it says that. All right. So, look. Jewish understanding of kashrut would have you not have meat and dairy in the same meal. That you'd have a separation of a, of a period of time between eating these things. Okay. On the one hand, there's the big problem that we have is Yahweh said something and we don't know what to do with it. Well, on the very straightforward Peshat, well, don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. Like literally. Okay, the Peshat, simple, straight, forward. But does it mean more? Our brothers in the Jewish community think it absolutely does. I'm not saying I necessarily disagree with them. And from that point of view, I do have an issue from Genesis where Abram puts the milk and the meat in front of Yahweh and he eats it. Of course, the Jewish brothers would say that's in, just let me give you the right, eight, uh, okay, I want to make sure I give you the right. I think it's 13, 14, 16, 18, 18, okay. Genesis 18, and it says here, Yahweh appeared to him, so and Abram notices it, and he says, Abram says, Yahweh, if I found favor in your eyes, please don't pass by. Let me get some water for you and feed you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he ran and sent uh, Sarah to go ahead and take three measures of flour and eat it and make cakes. And then Abram ran off to the herd and got a, a good calf and took it. And he took the curds and the milk and the calf, which was prepared, set it before them and stood by the tree while they ate. Because a proper host in the Near East in those days would have not eaten with the guests, would have served them and eaten separately. 
And just because that way his whole attention would be to make sure to take care of them. All right. So the Jewish community often responds with, well, that was before Moshe. I don't know that that actually works for me on account of, I don't think Yahweh changes. Okay. On the other side of all of this, there are people that will tell you from a purely biological point of view, meat and milk in your stomach doesn't work very good. So should you eat a cheeseburger? Probably unwise from a digestive point of view. Then again, where you're getting the cheeseburger, probably unwise anyway for the whole thing. <laughs> Because I know people have wondered about me because I don't eat cheeseburgers. I never liked a cheeseburger. I eat a lot of burgers. I don't like cheese on my burgers. I never did. Just a personal preference. But, you know, but that, Eduardo, that's a good question. I avoided it because I really didn't want to take that much time trying to parse out, you know, what the right thing is. But because, you know what? We have it said three times. So that means that it was important. Just like we just read a few times, do not eat the blood. So that's important. These are things that probably need a longer teaching. And we need to then figure out, or at least I do, I'm the one teaching you, what do we do with things like it says, don't cook a kid in its mother's milk, but it also shows what Avram did in chapter 18. What, what do we do with that? Now, you should be thinking, praise Yah, it's not my problem, it's Rabbi's problem. No, I don't mean that as a joke. That's kind of the whole point, that these things are vertical structure-wise. Okay, so we're not going to solve that riddle today, but I would let you know that just look it up and understand that when you eat dairy and meat together, that's not really great digestively. All right, so it's just something that you may want to consider. All right, Ashley. Um, and you thought that was better? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. He said he's awake, he's just not paying attention. <laughs> Your excuse is worse than what you're accused of. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Ooh, just like me on Sunday. <laughs> um, whew, sorry. I have, uh, you mentioned about the tithing, um, and it goes after every feast. Um, I want to make sure I heard you, and I understand you correctly, because I thought it was after every Sukkot feast you drop it off. No, no, you bring your tithe. Look, when they were dealing with the temple and living far away, and it could take them a good little journey to get there, they would bring their tithes three times a year. Oops. Okay? Now, we are in a, a, a time when we get paid, not by the crop or season of crops, we get paid weekly. We get paid bi-weekly, whatever we get paid. Okay, some people get paid the same day. And so you can bring your tithes as you have them available. Remember, this was an agricultural society that generally was getting their tithes from the harvest. The first harvest, right, you know, for Pesach and, and, and Eleven Bread, then, the, then you have Shavuot, then you have Sukkot. So you have got these harvest seasons that they're now collecting their tithe and bringing it, including the tithe of the animals, etc. So you don't need to do it just the three times. You certainly could. We're talking about the offering that's brought three times. Three times you show up and you bring something where it says, this is according to how you have blessed me. Okay. So that's an offering from your heart on top of your tithing. Okay. Okay? All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Kathy's coming up. All right, then after Kathy, we'll go to live stream. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Um, my question, you were talking with Ashley about the tithe. I have the opportunity, this, after this Sukkot starts my third tithe, my first third tithe year. Right. So my question is, you were just talking, if you're paid daily or weekly, you can bring it. So um, it would be easier for me because you've had me for two years using that as emergency fund. Thank you. Um, it's helped. So now it's a third tithe for benevolence. Can I bring it weekly or do I yeah. need to save that nope. back? No, nope. you. you can bring it as often as you have access to it. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, and by the way, just for everybody to understand, two things that one thing Kathy said that you may not have understood, which is one of the encouragements that I have recommended, we'll say it that way, it's not halakhically, you know, it's not straight from scripture, is that, you know, when you do the third tithe on the third and the sixth year, that could really emotionally maybe even be a challenge if you're not used to putting that amount aside by the time you get to year three and year six. So I said, well, then do all three every year. Just in year one and two, use that and put it as part of an emergency fund or a retirement fund or something. It's for you. But you're still just taking it out and not using it to pay your bills. So budget-wise, you're getting used to living on without that, living without that, okay? So when you get to year three, you're just changing who you're using it for. Instead of using it for yourself, you give it to the benevolence. All right? You give it, you send it in as your third tithe. But now you've had the habit and you're used to living without those three tithes. You have the first tithe, the second that's for the feast, and you got the third one. And the third one in year one and two, you're not using it as a tithe. You're just using it as 10% that you're putting aside for whatever you need. Maybe to buy a new car, maybe to buy something that you need that you normally wouldn't save for. It's for savings. Okay, it's for savings. But be diligent with it as if it's a tithe. Don't spend it on anything other than what you intended it to be. Okay? It's, it's not meant to do other things in your budget. You have to learn to live without it because it should not be something that if you're so used to pulling out of it, that then what are you going to do when it's the third tithe year? It has to be put aside. Okay? So you're used to putting it aside. Okay? The other thing that some of you may have missed, because I didn't say it this time as much as I needed to probably, was the tithing cycle goes Sukkot to Sukkot. So whatever you had left over of your second tithe, when you finish Sukkot, you, you need to divest of it and you need to make a donation of it because you need to start with zero again after Sukkot. The reason being that if you were to keep over, at some point you'll have so much excess you won't do it anymore. And he, he wants you to continue to have the habit of doing and obeying. And it's very hard to obey when you've got a whole bunch of it just sitting there that you didn't need, and now why do you need to bother? I mean, you already got enough for next year. Because some of you may do well in a year and have plenty for the next year. Especially if you don't have a huge family with lots of kids, and so it's, it's not really going to cost you that much to keep the feasts. And so we don't hold on to it beyond Sukkot. Okay, enjoy it during Sukkot, whatever's left over. We go ahead and put that in the box, and we start again from zero. All right? No, no, that's just an offering. Anything from second tithe just goes in as an offering. Okay, you don't have to write feast tithe or feast, I mean, feast offering or anything like that. Just write, just, just put it as an offering, okay? And so um, that way we'll just go into the general fund and we'll use it for whatever we can use it for, right? Um, so hopefully it answered all that. Grayson. From Nigel Phillips, does chapter 12, verse 8 and 9 connect to Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 6? If yes, please expand, expand if it's not as straightforward as it appears. Hey, make me go all the way here and find Hebrews 4. What? Hebrews 4 what? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Okay, we do not have time for where I'm going to have to read six verses and connect them to two verses. I need simple questions. From Yanni to And by the way, that, that's a rule going forward, period, okay? For all of you out there, if you've got a question like that, I will answer those types of questions. But if you're going to ask me to look up a verse and look up another section and read all of those and try to answer you, we don't have time for that, okay? That's not being respectful of the time. I'm not picking on Nigel. I love Nigel. He's going to be at the feast, by the way. We're going to get to see him. Yep. But just for everybody going forward, the looking back and forth, reading and coming up with an answer is going to take too long. If you ask me questions about what I'm actually talking about, much more straightforward. All right, go ahead. From Yanni, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21, fish today are not killed. They die out of the water in the fishing boat. What about, mix, what about milk mixed with ground beef and then cook it? We do this in Denmark. I don't. Okay. So I think I already answered the milk and meat thing with the same answer I offered earlier about it being not. At the very minimum, I think it's an unwise thing. All right. On the other side of it, and by the way, all you guys are thinking, but I love my meatball parm, my chicken parm. Your stomach doesn't. <laughs> Your digestive tract doesn't. 
okay? Just letting you know. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I always wondered why. Well, there might be a reason, okay? <laughs> the other one was about, what was the first part of that? The fish, the fish thing. Um, at a later date, we will talk more about how and what issues we have with how animals are killed and whether or not they're kosher, okay? That's something that's on my, on my plate to chew on for a while. I'm trying to make an eating metaphor, okay. All right? So does it matter how animals are killed and all that kind of stuff? And the answer is yes, okay? Grayson? From Lazarus, Rabbi, does Devarim 1221 make a case for the kosher slaughtering or, or animals? What does the as I commanded you mean in this passage? Also, is eating trife sin? All right. It's trafe, by the way. That's the Hebrew. But it's, it's hard when you're reading transliteration. Um, all right. So, all right, let's begin with the, all right, the, verse 21, the beginning of it, when it talks about when the place where Yahweh chooses is too far, then you shall slaughter from your herd. Okay. The slaughtering from your herd instruction here is simply saying, look, this is slaughtering that you um, have instruction should only be done in certain places at certain times. And I'm telling you, you can do this slaughtering here if you need to eat. Remember we talked about that if you're hungry, but this is not your tithe, this is not your offering, but you're allowed to kill some animals from your herd and use them for, for food. As far as whether it's being shekt, which is the killing, the proper killing of the animal, whether it's shekted correctly, it doesn't seem to say any of that in there as that being the issue. Of course, if they were using it in those days, the way they were taught, there would have been a whole process to that, especially for those being done in the tabernacle, okay? The rest of the question, as I commanded you, let's see. So, um, okay, the as I have commanded you, he's asking if that maybe has to do with the instructions, I think, for, for the, on how to slaughter. I don't have any instructions anywhere in the Torah directly. Those are things that are in the Talmud, that are in other writings, on like how you would do that. would be something that they would have understood. And so I'm learning about that more to share with you when I'm ready and comfortable to do that. I happen to know somebody who is trained in, in slaughtering animals, at least from a, you know, an Orthodox Jewish perspective, from a, from a kosher, from a Jewish perspective. And so I'm learning what they do, why they do it, and where they think the sourcing is on that, okay? So I'll share that when it's appropriate. Um, is eating trafe sin? Um, okay, so give me one second. I want to just check something for myself here real quickly before I say something and I don't get it correct. Okay. Okay. I was correct. I just want to make sure that I'm, I have my right Hebrew word here. So, growing up, I remember this being used all the time because treif is unclean animals. Treif is pork. Treif is fish that don't have fins and scales. Treif, okay? So, is eating treif sin? Yes. Okay? It's just a word that I haven't used in many, many, many years. <laughs> you know, you can't eat that. It's treif. All right. All right. You can't eat what's trafe. If you do, it's sin. All right. Sin is the transgressing of the law. Sin is trespassing into an area you should, don't belong in. You should not be eating this. It's sin. All right. Next. From William R., chapter 15, verse 21. I was wondering what type of evil means in this passage, but when there is any defect in it, lame or blind, or has any evil defect, do not slaughter it to Yahweh your Elohim. Okay, so you have to go back to the evil teaching and what's evil. So evil is anything that causes harm, suffering, dis, uh, destruction, ruin. So an evil defect, in other words, it, some, a defect that ruined it in some place, some way. They're ruined, damaged in, in, some, in some manner there. So evil is not, unless you have listened to the evil teaching, it's not just the way we've always been taught, something that's like of the devil or something, like evil. Anything that causes suffering, harm, pain, 
uh, ruin, destruction, these are all things that are ultimately received, perceived as evil. Okay? But go listen to the teaching. What is evil? All right, next. All right, the teaching might have just been called evil. So, all right, next. Question from Rabbi Tom. Does he mean treif or tripe? No, he was asking about treif. He spe- I, believe- I mean, he spelled it right in the transliteration. That was fine. Okay. Um, I believe that is all for the live stream. Awesome. Awesome. I hope this is a blessing to everybody. Your perfect timing. Everybody was clapping for Rebbitson walking in the room. <laughs> I mean, she walked in, everybody started clapping. <laughs> it was like, well, of course, thank you. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and get somebody to close us in prayer. Let's see. How about Eduardo? You want to come up and close us in prayer? Okay, he's coming around. I gave it to Eduardo because he got his hand up like a second slower than Rocky initially. So I said, I'll give him the close because he didn't get the opening. All right, if you'll all rise, we'll go ahead and close in prayer as Eduardo leads us in the closing. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we adore you and love you. We praise you and thank you, beloved Father, for bringing us together as an assembly uh, this evening to uh, study your instructions. Uh, help us, Abba, to walk in your ways to be uh, doers of your word and not just hearers. And as we go out into the world, help us to uh, represent your will and your way uh, in a righteous way. We praise you and thank you. We ask all this to you and we pray. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 All right. I'm going to come out there. I guess this side. (laughs) All right. Anybody wants to be on camera, come on this side of the room. We're going to wave goodbye over there. Here comes Robinson. Thank you. All right. Make room. We'll have Ben and Brianna go stand there. All right, cool. Excellent. All right, I'm just going to watch and see when everybody's sort of in position. All right. Move on in. Get situated. If you look up on the screen, you'll know if you're on camera. Okay. All right. So all of you out there, we want you to know that we appreciate that you're part of the group, even though you're not physically here. And so we always love to end our meetings with our kind of talking directly to you guys and connecting with you by letting you know how much we love you. So what we do is we're going to wish everybody out there a Lila Tov, which is a good night. A Shavua Tov, which is a good week, and we're going to tell them that we love them. Here we go. On three. One, two, three.